Good morning and welcome. Thank you to those that have joined us on the line for uh, this first in-person meeting mm -hmm. on the committee to assess the distribution of uh, fisheries management benefits. <laughs> um, I wanna welcome everybody on the line and those in the room as well. And I'll just uh, get us started with a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our chair, Tom Miller. So to start, um, for those that have joined us in the room, just a, a quick note um, about emergency procedures. Um, if there is an emergency and we need to exit this room, we'll go straight out the two doors behind me. To your left, once you hit the landing area, there are two large wood doors uh, that will head to the west side of our building. We'll use those as an emergency exit. If you're wanting to enter or exit the building not in an emergency, you'll use the Constitution Avenue or the C Street entrances. Um, and restrooms are, if you go um, out this direction to the landing area, you'll make a right. And when you see a hallway on the left, you'll make a left. Um, and restrooms are on the left as well. For those that are um, joining online, thank you for doing so. We are, um, the committee is meeting together in person with a few additional guests. Um, but we are largely also represented on Zoom. So we will try to make sure that you can hear and see us when we're speaking. And um, just a couple of housekeeping items for those on the line. We will be using the raise hand feature to uh, respond to um, requests to speak. And also um, we will be recording this session. So um, please do use the raise hand feature if you'd like to chime in and uh, We'll call on you in the order in which we see the hands online. I think with that, Tom, I can turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacey. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Miller. I'm the chair of this committee. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Biological Lab. Um, this is our fifth committee meet meeting. As Stacey said, it's the first one um, that we've had in person. Uh, I'm still surprised to see that my fellow committee members have body parts below about this le le level and are actually in three, three, th 3D. Um, our task in this committee is to help the National Marine Fishery Service assess equity in the distribution of fishery management benefits um, to help them understand the data and information that is available uh, and how they can assess uh, the, the distribution of primary benefits uh, to which National Marine Fishery Service think of as permits and qu qu quota. Um, this is our fifth me me meeting and we've already heard from a lot of different um, people involved in the fishery. Uh, and this morning we're going to begin hearing um, from people from regional fishery management offices around the nation um, who have particular insights into um, economic and socio-economic aspects of, of National Marine Fisheries work. So um, with that, I'm going to ask the other committee members to go around the table and introduce themselves. I'm going to start to my immediate left with Kaylin. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so I'm Kaylin Kretz. I'm an assistant professor of environmental and resource economics at ASU School of Sustainability. And uh, let's see, I'm also on the North Pacific Scientific and Statistical Committee. Jim Sankirko, professor of environmental science and policy at the University of California at Davis and a member of the Ocean Studies Board. Good morning, I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama uh, in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and Sociology. And I also serve on the Gulf Council's Scientific, uh, Standing Scientific and Statistical Committee. Good 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Donkersloat, and I manage a small research and consulting firm in Antioch, Alaska, and my background's in understanding the social and cultural dimensions of our fishery systems in the North Pacific. Um, and I currently serve on the on a task force set up by the North Pacific Council that's looking to better include and account for local and traditional knowledge in our fishery decision making. Good morning, I'm Lisa Campbell. I'm a professor at the Duke University Marine Lab. I'm the chair in Marine Affairs of Policy, and I'm also a regular member of the Ocean Studies Board. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Grant Murray. I'm also at the Duke University Marine Lab, where I'm Associate Professor of Marine Policy. Good morning. Uh, I'm Matt Reimer, Associate Professor at UC Davis in the Agriculture and Resource Economics Department and a uh, member of the uh, Science and Statistical Committee at the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Thank you, Matt. Stacy. Thank you, Stacy Karras. I am a Senior Program Officer with the Ocean Studies Board staff at the National Academies, and I'm the study director for uh, this committee. Leanne? Hi, my name is Leanne Martin. Um, I am an Associate Program Officer on the Ocean Studies Board, helping with this study. Eric? Eric Unisco, Program Assistant on the Ocean Studies Board with the National Academies. Thank you, Eric. Um, this morning we have um, two presentations um, first, Michael Travis from the Southeast region, followed by Min Yang Li from the Northeast region. Um, each speaker has been allotted 30 minutes. There will be um, questions of clarification immediately following the presentation. And then we've set aside a 45 minute sort of discussion panel uh, in which the committee members can ask more um, overview questions or broader qu questions leading from the presentation. So, um, Michael, can we turn the gavel over to you, please, for your presentation? You most certainly may, but it will be only on a verbal basis because unfortunately I'm not in the office today and my camera on my laptop is not working this morning. So you will hear me, but unfortunately you will not be able to see me. Um, and thank you for the staff for bringing up the presentation. Um, again, my name is Michael Travis. Um, I am an economist, but I am also the social science branch chief here at the Southeast Regional Office. Uh, we want to thank the National Academy of Sciences for giving us the opportunity to present on this very important topic. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to myself, I wanna thank Matt McPherson, who is a social science branch chief at the Science Center, Christina Package and Ed Glazier, who are anthropologists here in the regional office, and Christopher Biza, an economist in the Science Center, for all of their assistance in, in answering the questions that the panel sent to us. Uh, we received seven questions that we are supposed to address in this presentation. We have chosen to answer six of those questions, and, and I will cover those in succession here shortly. But I did want to point out that there was one question that we did not feel comfortable addressing. Um, and I've noted that on this slide. It's the question that asks, are there types of socioeconomic data related to equity that the council or councils um, is using, relying on in decision making? Uh, we kind of felt that this was asking us to get into the heads of council members. And we, you know, we did not want to try to do that. Uh, so we are recommending to this panel that that question be posed to either council staff or even better yet, ask the council members themselves directly because they really are the best ones to answer that question. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first question, which is 
where we had the most information to provide. So what initiatives, if any, related to new socioeconomic data collections have been undertaken within your region? So in late 2017, the Southeast Regional Office began collecting certain demographic data, specifically race, ethnicity, and sex, on our commercial and for hire vessel, dealer, and operator permit application forms. We can also discern age information from the data collected on those forms. Now, we also decided to add a section for permit holders to identify the industry that they are primarily involved in and whether they are a small business according to the applicable small business size threshold. Now, that information is then to be used in analyses that examine whether there are potential disproportionate effects between small and large businesses. And we think that that is relevant to equity considerations. Now, provision of this information, because it's on the permit application forms, has been mandatory. And that is exactly why we added the questions to those forms. So this is our attempt to try to get census level information for this kind of data. Next slide, please. Now, in general, crew members here have mostly been ignored by the fishery management process. And that has been at least partly due, if not largely due, to a lack of data on crew members. However, the Science Center is currently working with captains of commercial vessels in the Gulf of Mexico to conduct a survey of crew members. This survey covers the commercial sector of all federally managed fisheries in the Gulf. So this is a first, we have never done anything like this before. Uh, the survey is collecting data on demographics, the nature of crew work at sea, and what we'll generally call other human aspects of fishing operations in the Gulf. Now the current plan is to expand this survey to crew uh, com on commercial vessels in the South Atlantic next year subject to funding availability. And that, that's a big asterisk there because we don't currently have the funding, but fingers crossed, we're gonna get it. Next slide, please. Also recently we have started, and this is a, a joint effort between the center and the regional office. We've initiated a large scale project to examine equity and environmental justice or what we call EJ issues among people engaged in or impacted by NOAA fishery services in our federally managed fisheries. The focus group meetings are gonna be conducted in order to interact with and identify people from historically underserved populations who have experienced barriers to equitable participation in NOAA fishery services. Now, these focus group meetings are intended to elicit information on barriers to engagement and the ways these people have adapted to these barriers. The information that we collect from these focus group meetings and the subsequent analyses will be captured in our Southeast EJ implementation plan. And that information will also be used to inform our social impact analyses in our regulatory documents. Next slide, please. Another program is our NIMS Social Indicators Program, where we continue to aggregate data generated by the Census Bureau for use in assessing EEJ issues in our fishing-oriented communities in the Southeast. Currently, the program is focused on development and application of three basic indices for examining local vulnerabilities to various forms of social and environmental change. And those three are personal disruption, population composition, and poverty. There's a lot more to this particular program that we don't have time to discuss in this presentation, but I provided a link so that those who are interested in all the details can go to that link and find that additional information. Next slide, please. Another program is our NOAA Fisheries Voices database. Now this database includes oral histories gathered from fishermen and members of fishing communities. Now, unfortunately, this work is no longer being funded. That was a, a recent decision we just found out about, but some of the relatively newer contributions to this collection include oral histories on 
the History of Red Tide events um, here on the west coast of Florida, which is a recurring and rather important problem. Uh, interviews in the greater Tampa Bay area with commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and fish dealers. Um, interviews in Cortez, Florida, which is one of our better known fishing communities with various members of that community. Uh, we have also done interviews with fishery council members throughout the southeast. Um, and a number of interviews were done that focused on the effects from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster. And again, lots more information on this. I provided a link where you can find additional details on this particular program. Next slide, please. In addition, the center routinely collects economic data and somewhat more recently has started to produce economic reports for most federally managed fisheries in the southeast. Now, these data and the results apply to vessels in each fishery. So a, a, com, you know, a commercial fishing business, not to individuals. Now, this data is used to measure the distribution of monetary benefits and costs within the harvesting sector of these fisheries. So this program is limited to the harvesting sector. It does not extend beyond that. Now these annual data and reports are available for our South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico shrimp fisheries, the reef fish and sapper grouper fisheries, as well as our mackerel fisheries. Now smaller fisheries are assessed on an ad hoc basis every few years. So I'd say generally like three to five years as funding allows. So some of our recent efforts have included the wreck fish uh, fishery in the South Atlantic, which is managed under NITQ, as well as commercial fisheries in the US Virgin Islands. Now in Puerto Rico, we rely on what they call a fisherman census that collects information on participants in their commercial fisheries. And again, that's a periodic data collection. Now the center has also attempted to collect basically the same economic information for the four higher sector. But these efforts have generally been ad hoc and the most recent trip level survey was back in 2017. So it's getting a little dated. Uh, we also added limited economic and social questions to the new Southeast for higher logbook data collection program or what we call CFIRE. And that started in January of 2021. Next slide, please. So what issues or lessons have we learned as a result of these uh, new initiatives? So after the first six months, the regional office determined that the small business section of our permit application forms was not easily understood by our permit applicants. We got a number of complaints and questions fielding more phone calls than I can recall. And that unfortunately led to some poor compliance and poor data quality in those first six months. So we worked with staff, we talked to permit holders and that section was reorganized and we have had much higher compliance and much data quality since that question or that section was reorganized. We also, at least initially encounter resistance from some of our permit holders and even from some of our own staff to asking for demographic data. So we basically had to engage in some outreach and ed education where we had to verbally explain the purposes for collecting that data to a lot of our permit applicants and our own staff. Um, and that has again led to improved compliance and improved data quality, at least for a few years. Unfortunately, a few years later, we ran into some additional complications as the permits office chose to gradually shift from paper-based application forms to online electronic application forms. And as a result of that gradual shift, we started to lose some demographic data related to various permits over about a two year time period. Um, thankfully, this issue has been largely addressed or was largely addressed as of August of 2021 when a new permit database came online. Next slide, please. Now, the regional office also attempted to add the same demographic and small business questions to our Gulf IFQ shareholder account application forms in 2021. And the reason that we decided to do that 
is that uh, in a recent review of those programs that we did, we determined that we were not getting any demographic data from shareholders who did not possess permits. Uh, if you don't have a permit, then you're not being asked the questions from the permit form. So it seemed logical to try to fill that data hole by adding these questions to that particular form. Unfortunately, our request to add those questions to that form was denied by OMB. Further, OMB informed us that they would no longer approve any mandatory data collection efforts for demographic or small business data by our agency. So our current approval for these questions on our permit application forms is expiring early next year, and we expect to be denied to continue to include those questions, at least on a mandatory basis on those forms. So OMB has advised us that what we should do is we should separate those questions from the rest of the permit application forms and indicate their responses to the demographic and small business data is purely voluntary. And we will probably take them up um, on that offer, even though we strongly suspect that our response rates are going to go down, exactly how much they're going to go down and how that will affect the quality of the data you know, is to be determined, but this is what we've been told. Um, in addition, regardless, the structure and content of our race and ethnicity questions will change next year because OMB has already proposed uh, changes to those questions um, under a recent federal register notice that I think came out, I don't know, January or February of this year. And so they're basically giving agencies uh, two different approaches to asking for race and ethnicity. We will choose the simpler version or the simpler option there. I've provided, for those who are unaware, a link to that Federal Register notice that lays out their proposals. Uh, we would imagine that the, those new standards will be in place probably early part of next year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, an earlier attempt to survey crews only in the Gulf of Mexico shrimp fishery did not succeed. Uh, that effort, we, we tried to voluntarily enlist randomly selected vessel owners in helping to deliver a mail survey to their crew members. We ran a pretest as we were required to do, and that pretest indicated that most vessel owners were not going to participate or cooperate. So, in light of those difficulties, that is what led to the current commercial crew survey effort. And that was developed over a number of years to identify and enlist a network of fishery stakeholders, including dealers, port agents, vessel owners, and commercial fishing associations to identify where and when potential interviewers could intercept crews at the dock. Next slide, please. Lack of dedicated funding. Um, we've learned that that's, I think we probably already knew, but that's definitely uh, hindered our collection of social data on fishery participants, particularly with respect to crew and also with respect to the employees of seafood dealers and processors. In addition, the Southeast has a very small staff of non-economist social scientists stretched across three council regions. So remember, we covered the Gulf Council, South Atlantic Council, and Caribbean Council. Um, in general, a lack of resources has precluded us from significantly expanding our socioeconomic data collection programs. However, some progress has been made with a relatively small but permanent increase in the social science budget and staff numbers in the Science Center. I would like to say that's true in the regional office, but it is not true in the regional office. Um, another uh, issue that we've encountered is, and this has become worse in recent years, is that the length of time it takes to process a data collection request, particularly a new request, through OMB under the Paperwork Reduction Act um, has also limited our ability to effectively collect data in a timely manner. So typically these days, and maybe Min Yang will speak to this uh, because we've all run into it, I would say minimum of six to nine months to get a new data collection effort uh, cleared under PRA through OMB. Next slide, please. 
Next question. Are there socioeconomic data collection efforts that have been tried and failed? Um, we're going to interpret failed a little bit broadly here. So I already mentioned the, the shrimp crew survey effort and how that didn't work, but how we adapted. Um, I should also mention the Gulf portion of the CFIRE program was recently invalidated by an unfortunate court decision. And so we need to rebuild that entire program. The South Atlantic portion of the program is still in place. However, in both cases, um, compliance with reporting requirements has been relatively poor um, in the first two years of the program. And that's not just with respect to social and economic data, but just in general, it's been poor. Um, I will also mention that we did collect demographic data on participants in the Gulf Cooper Tilefish IFQ program as part of our first five-year review of that program. However, that data was limited to just grouper and tilefish fishermen. Uh, and so the Gulf reef fish fishery, you know, has a number of species beyond grouper and tilefish. So that survey did not cover red snapper, rather importantly, other snappers, gray triggerfish, greater amberjack, et cetera. So unfortunately, that data was a limited applicability to other research and analyses. Also, that particular survey took a lot of time to collect the data and generate a report. Um, and since we are now almost 10 years removed from that, it's likely that data is probably not of current use, um, particularly given all the turmoil that we've seen in Gulf fisheries in the last several years. We have had, for those unaware, we have had a number of fisheries disasters in the last several years in the Gulf, particularly with respect to landfall and hurricanes. Next slide, please. Are there groups of people that you think are not being considered in current efforts, but should be? So the regional office intentionally did not include a question regarding household income of individuals associated with a federal permit on our application form. Um, what we had noticed from previous survey efforts is that surprisingly, Household income is often seen as a more sensitive question than race and ethnicity. So at the present time, we do not have data to determine which or how many individuals or households affected by our regulatory actions may be low income. And that, that is a hole in our information with respect to a number of mandates that ask us to look at effects on low income people. Also, we have not yet planned on an effort to survey crew on four hire vessels. But again, we are hoping to do so in the future, subject to funding. Next slide, please. Uh, we also do not require permits for private recreational anglers at the present time. And so again, we do not possess demographic data on recreational anglers. Now, currently the Gulf and South Atlantic councils are considering such a requirement at least for certain species. So um, we're hoping that there may be an opportunity in the future to collect that kind of information. It's also the case that workers at seafood processing, uh, businesses and seafood dealers have also not yet been characterized in social and economic terms. We have not done any surveys for them. Um, economic data on seafood dealers and processors is currently very limited particularly compared to our harvesting sector. Um, all we have for them is total ex vessel production and value. Uh, for processors, we do have some additional information on number of employees and whether they are full-time or part-time. Point being is that consideration of effects um, on those particular entities from our regulatory actions is still pretty limited. Next slide, please. Are there types of data in our analyses related to equity the council is requesting? So we did struggle with this one a little bit. Uh, in all fairness, the Gulf and South Atlantic councils were the ones to ask us to initiate the economic data collection program for the commercial sectors of our fisheries many years ago. Um, so that is thanks to them. 
Uh, the councils also requested that we collect a limited amount of economic and social data for the for hire sector. From their perspective at the time that they asked for these data collections, the purpose was to evaluate changes in economic performance over time due to changes in management or other factors. It can be used for other purposes, but, but that was their main purpose. Now, the Gulf and South Atlantic councils have also requested that we update our willingness to pay estimates that we use to estimate the economic value of recreationally harvested fish, as admittedly a number of those are very dated at this point. And although not requested, the five-year reviews that we've done of our catch share programs always provide Gini coefficient estimates showing how the distributions of landings and revenue for IFQ managed species have changed over time, both at the vessel level and at the entity or the business level. However, importantly, these estimates have not been used to inform management decisions, at least not yet, that may change soon. Next slide, please. Now, the councils have also occasionally asked staff to determine whether the economic effect, effects of regulatory alternatives being considered for a particular action are proportionally different. This has been particularly important with regard to a number of sector allocation decisions uh, that uh, the Gulf and South Atlantic councils have made in the last several years. So, for example, there asking us to look at what are the percentage changes in economic value or net economic benefits in each sector or component of a sector across the alternatives being considered. That is a common question. Based on our observation, if they are about the same, the council seem to consider that to be equitable. If they differ greatly, the council seem to consider that to not be equitable. However, there is no guidance on how to make that determination, either for analysts or for council members. And I say that, I'm not trying to point fingers, I'm just saying this is something everyone has recognized. There are a number of mandates that require us to consider equity in decisions. Uh, the regional administrators previously talked about that in their presentations, but the fact of the matter is there's no guidance for the council members or for the analysts on how to decide what is or is not equitable. Next slide, please. Last question, I believe. Are there differences in data information needs for initially setting up a permit or allocation system versus monitoring changes in a fishery over time? Our general answer is no, we don't think so. Programs to collect economic and social data should be in place for all federally managed fisheries, and definitely prior to setting up a new, what you folks call the permit or application or allocation system. Otherwise, it's very difficult to determine the economic and social effects of, a, of implementing such a system or program, and similarly difficult to determine how economic and social performance is likely to differ under proposed alternative management approaches. So this was in fact the rationale for including a handful of economic and social questions on the for hire logbook program. Um, and those were limited to number of crew, number of paying passengers, fees collected, price of fuel and fuel used. So five questions. And yet those five questions led to a lot of fishermen dissatisfaction, um, even with a lot of uh, outreach and education that went on. And then ultimately that dissatisfaction led to the lawsuit. And as I mentioned, we unfortunately lost that lawsuit in the Gulf. Um, I'll also point out, and this is my last uh, comment, is that this same issue was also addressed by another National Academy of San Sciences panel and in a report on limited access privilege programs in mixed use fisheries. So it, this is a, a common question and concern. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I'll just ask the committee if there are any questions for clarification. Jim?
I'm not sure what the right order of like I'm supposed to raise my hand, put it on Zoom or whatever. Um, thank you so much. That was incredibly valuable. Lots a ton of information. I have a gazillion questions, but I'm just gonna go back to your crew survey. And when you guys were thinking about uh, implementing that, I could see why the vessels might be concerned because it could be questions or they might assume there might be questions about crew satisfa sac satisfaction about being on their vessel. So you can see how that might create some issues with labor. Uh, but when you were asking the questions, did you think about um, trying to build out an idea of how long individuals work crew to sort of distinguish between, you know, if you just do a snapshot, you're going to get a set of crew, but you wouldn't necessarily know this person's been around for 20 years in the fishery as a crew member versus this one just came out of high school and is there for a week. Um, so how did you guys sort of think about disentangling those issues in your surveys? So I am not one of the leads on the crew survey. Uh, Matt McPherson and Christina uh, Package Ward have been more closely involved with that. So Matt, I think I'm going to defer to you and Christina on this one. Okay, so the uh, the failed effort that Mike referred to was a crew survey that we attempted to attach to the to the shrimp survey that we sent out and to ask vessel owners to distribute that to their crew and have them fill it out. And that didn't work. Um, but we currently have a crew survey that's uh, that's in the field right now. Um, it's more of a we are collaborating with some uh, vessel owners, but it's not systematically being implemented with vessel owners. It's more of an intercept survey. Um, we asked all of those questions about how long, you know, how long a uh, crew have been, um, you know, working um, as fishermen. We asked about different fisheries. We've asked about their, you know, all their demographics. We asked about, um, you know, their income. So it's a, it's a fairly extensive survey um it's uh somewhat based on i think uh imagine min yang will mention this survey in his presentation but it's based on a crew survey that was done initially started initially up in the northeast <coughs> um and so we had pra clearance for that survey and we meant to initiate the survey back in uh 2019 and we were uh interrupted by COVID, so that's why we're we're doing it this year, but we're actually in the field right now implementing that survey in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, my understand, I mean, so far we've been very successful in terms of our um, response rates. All right, thank you. One more question from the committee for clarification, Grant. Yeah, I'll add my thanks for that presentation. I also found that very informative. Um, I had a question about another survey that you mentioned, um, a large scale survey that I believe is in the conceptualization stage. Uh, the phrase I wrote down was people engaged in or substantially impacted by NOAA fisheries services. And I was wondering if you had any information about how that was defined or conceptualized. Have you moved towards thinking about how you would sample that, how you would define what groups would be included in that? Anything you could add to that would be helpful. So again, I am not the lead on this one either. Uh, Christina, I would appreciate it if you would answer this one. Sure thing. So we're involved in doing uh, focus groups throughout the Gulf, South Atlantic and Caribbean. And we have, I believe, is it 21? Uh, planned and we're currently trying to find participants at all locations, but basically trying to find participants that are involved in, you know, fisheries as well as protected resources um, and habitat. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Matt, but we're basically using contacts like Sea Grant agents and our council partners to find participants or suggest participants. No, uh, nothing to add other than the fact that this is, uh, you know, this is a series of of uh, focus groups, um, you know, throughout the region. So it's not it's not a survey. Uh, they're focus groups to learn more about, you know, the uh, underserved populations and, um, you know, how they've been 
differentially impacted by, you know, fisheries and fisheries regulations. Any other questions from the committee? If not, um, Michael and, and your team, thank you very much. I hope you'll wait around for um, the 11.15 panel discussion where I think we'll get into broader discussions. But um, I want to thank you all for a very, very clear presentation that certainly um, really helped me understand the efforts in the Southeast re region and particularly some of the constraints you face from na national decisions that probably aren't motivated by fishery resource qu qu questions, um, but clearly make your life more challenging. So thank you very much. All right. Um, our next presentation, uh, we go from the Southeast to the Northeast. And uh, Min Yang Lee uh, is an economist with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Min Yang, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, are my slides coming up? They are, yes. They are. Oh, my up goodness. As, um, they're not in a presentation mode. I don't, there you go. They are now. All right. All right, it is um, nice to go second. <laughs> um, so I, I took some of Stacy's questions more as a suggestion than a requirement, certainly more of a suggestion than Mike did. Um, our group works with the, the regional office the, uh, and the two fishery management councils in our, in our region. Um, I'm an economist. Um, I'm gonna do my best to represent our entire group. Um, I'm a little bit outside my element for a couple areas though. Um, Greg Ardini, Trish Clay, Matt Cutler, uh, Patricia Pinto da Silva, and Sam Werner were really helpful in putting these slides together. Uh, let's see. That, I'm hoping that advanced. I do want to be very clear that um, the words in blue here are my opinions and my conclusions. I think they're kind of reasonable. Maybe I'm overstepping a lot, um, but I, I couldn't resist. Um, you know, so what, what data do we have in general? Um, in my opinion, we, we don't have enough. We're, we're all right on, on some of the economic things and a little the opposite of that, I'd say, in, in some of the socio-cultural arenas. Uh, in my opinion, this is because we just haven't been investing in it, in it as an agency. Um, it's some of these, um, these, these data, these, these metrics um, are not well understood by leadership. Um, particularly the socio-cultural ones, and even more particularly the qualitative ones. Um, they're not really well understood um, by folks who would use this information, and they're, you know, they're not well communicated at by our group. Um, so, you know, there's 65 social scientists and economists at fisheries. Um, that's that's not a lot. There's far more economists and social scientists, and economists, you know, historically have not done a great job with equity stories. Um, and so that, that, I think that's, that's, that's my kind of read of, of the situation. Um, we have lots of data um, that is collected by the regional office. I understand Mike Penthony talked to you about a lot of these. And so I'm not gonna talk about them very in, in much detail, um, except to note that you know on the crew information side, we don't have a crew registry, we don't have crew identifiers, so we don't have crew demographics. That makes our crew survey difficult. Uh, we do have captain information or operator permits. We have very minimal demographic information on that front. Um, we have male, female, we have date of birth, we have a photograph, but no ethnicity, race, or household status. And we have a little information on firm ownership. So we'll have a firm name and, and person's name. We do or we are fortunate to have a, quite a few purpose-built socioeconomic data collections in our region. Um, we have a cost survey that's been implemented three times, a crew survey that's in, implemented three times. Both of those last two are, the cost survey just, just finished and the crew survey is currently in the field. We have an owner socioeconomic survey that was implemented about 10 years ago now. 
uh, which makes me feel a little old. Um, we have um, about six recreational valuation surveys, and we have the NOAA Voices Oral History Archives that, that Mike talked about. Um, there's also the, a seafood harvesters marketing uh, survey that's going out in the field and a rec expenditure survey. I believe those are both national projects. I was not planning on talking about them, but I did want to make sure that they were on your radar. So the cost survey. The cost survey was implemented for the third time this year. It is a voluntary mail and internet survey of firms that own at least a one fishing permit. They may have more than one permit, but they answer vessel level questions. And this gives us a better understanding of firm level profits because we can collect things like information on insurance, on repair, on crew payments. Um, one of the issues is low response rates and survey fatigue. Um, a, another primary data collection is our crew socioeconomic survey, also for the third time. Um, it, it is a voluntary in-person intercept survey. It is super labor intensive to implement, um, and it's designed to assess social and economic well-being of crew. Um, it's in the field right now. It is one of the few ways we can collect some um, ethnicity information um, from, from the folks in our fisheries. Uh, I guess it's not new anymore. <laughs> um, so we, we also implemented an owner socioeconomic survey um, in 2013. It was designed as a copy of the crew survey, but for owners. Um, collected things like landing port, mooring port, some household demographics like marital status, age, education, race, um, and language at home. Um, there has not been a follow-up since 2013, and I don't believe one is planned. We've done, I believe, about six, six recreational surveys over the past, say, 12, 15 years. Um, the population there are the licensed recreational anglers in the Northeast that would target a particular species. Our sample frames are typically built off of the state um, angler registries. So we work in heavy collaboration or in collaboration with, with states to, to get this done. Um, our goal here is to figure out how changes in the number of fish that are caught um, will affect angler participation. And we use this um, pretty extensively to set regulations in, in a couple of our fisheries. We do collect a little bit of demographic information, mostly things that are related, or, or there are things that are economists think are related to willingness to pay for wreck fishing, um, income, education, um, age, that sort of thing. Um, and I will say one of the issues here is that they're always focused on these like hot fisheries for management purposes. Either it's politically and culturally important like ground fish um, or rec has a really large fraction of the overall fishing mortality um, like striped bass. Uh, Mike talked about the Voices Oral History Program. Um, it is a national program, um, but I, I do wanna highlight it because it is kind of run out of our, our office. Um, it, it seeks to document the human experience as it relates to the, the coast. Um, and information has been collect, that has been collected has been used in a variety of ways, um, from including understanding equity and environmental justice for minority groups, disaster impacts, as, as Mike talked about. Um, and I will say that, um, again, as Mike mentioned, uh, the Office of Science and Technology is discontinuing voices funding after 2024. So that is the end of my, my tour of the socioeconomic, the primary socioeconomic data. Um, to get to some of these questions that Stacy forwarded on, um, socioeconomic data efforts that have been tried and failed. Um, in the most recent version of the cost survey, vessel owners had really strong negative reactions to the demographic questions. And so those demographics were removed. This is a voluntary survey and you got to do what you got to do to um, ensure that your response rates are good. We had a social capital survey that we tried to implement a few years ago, um, and that was not approved by Office of Management and Budget. And we did think about implementing a higher frequency cost survey. All right, 
uh, groups of people who were not include who we who we are not including in our current efforts. This is certainly food for thought. I feel so unconfident in these answers because I mean it's like what's the edge of what you know? Um, anyway, crew, um, you know we we are not we definitely are not considering them. Um, we we or to the extent that we should. Um, frequency is, is fairly lo low frequency. Uh, shore side infrastructure firms um, and labor at those firms. Um, in the Northeast, folks who work there are, frequently is the wrong word, often maybe is a little better, <laughs> are, are often undocumented. They are often non-Hispanic South American uh, women, don't speak English, don't speak Spanish. Um, they have really tenuous labor relations, and it's hard to encourage those people to share those their stories and hard to amplify their stories. Um, we, we don't consider consumers that often, um, and the same goes with the tribal and, and indigenous groups in our region. Another slide <laughs> on, on who's not considered. <laughs> You know this this future generations story. You know how will um, how will future fishermen be able to afford to buy access rights from those who currently hold them? How will groups um, who typically have poor access to capital markets how will they find financing to buy those rights? I'm thinking about people and groups that did not qualify. Either you had no fishing history, or you had no documented fishing history. Perhaps you were fishing well, or your group was fishing well before the the you know industrialized fishing era um, and and stopped before 1990, I suppose, when, when things were, were allocated. I would like to point out subsistence rec users who are likely to have a lower income, likely to a little more than, at least compared to, in our region, compared to the fun recreational users, likely to be lower income, likely to be minority, um, not likely to benefit much from these trophy kind of measures that are sometimes in place. And then of course, you know, people who don't show up to council meetings that either can't afford to take time off from work or just don't see the benefit in going. Socioeconomic data related to equity that the council is using and requesting. So we, we typically provide analysis of things like revenue divided out or broken down by port or by gear, maybe by vessel size, um, certainly by community, um, and certainly during IFQ um, or catch our reviews for analysis of non-qualifying firms. We have a limited ability to provide more kind of disaggregated metrics. Um, the council has certainly asked us what we are doing on the equity and environmental justice front. And we do have an EEJ strategy. Um, but it is unclear how we're going to do it and, and, and where we're going to find resources to do it. So I kind of pulled together some of our common issues and obstacles. I do think we're under-resourced. We have uh, an occasional cruise survey, you know, three in about 10 years. We have occasional cost surveys. Um, and the one-year funding cycle is really tough for this. Uh, the Voices Project, is at least funding is being discontinued by science and technology. We have three three staff in our region with sociocultural training. Um, we do have more economists, um, but you know, economists are not the best at equity, <laughs> and certainly not the economists that are in our group um, are not. Um, I think the importance of the of socioeconomic data, um, particularly qualitative socioeconomic data, is not well understood. Um, perhaps by leadership, perhaps by, by councils. And this leads to the sentiment that, you know, no one's gonna use this information in any way, um, or it's not gonna really factor into the decision-making process, which has real impacts for our response rates. Um, and I think in particular with respect to qualitative information, it's hard to compare a crew survey that's run three times in 10 years with a bottom trawl survey that's got, you know, bajillions of data points and a 60 year time series. Um, 
And I think it, it's not it's not been trusted. There's a bumper sticker that's you know on many many trucks in, in the region. It says you know National Marine Fisheries Service destroying fishermen in the communities since 1976. And again, it it is hard to collaborate and to it's it's hard to kind of win back that trust. Um, and that leads to this kind of feeling or this perception that. You know, if I, as a fisherman or someone related to fishing, answers your survey, you know, this information is either not going to be used or it's going to be used against me somehow. And how, how that somehow is, is kind of nebulous, but it sort of points to this, like, there's no upside for me in answering your survey. And that, that's something you kind of have to battle with. More, more issues. Um, as Mike alluded to, the PRA process is pretty honor, onerous. Um, incentives aren't permitted, um, and that, that that that's certainly tough. Um, the short-term funding, the one-year funding cycle is really difficult too. Um, these surveys, um, crew cost are, are difficult. They're really difficult. Um, and so we, we worry and we are concerned about survey fatigue. Um, the cost survey response weight, rates have gone from 32% to 24 to seven, and I believe hopefully up to the 20s in 2023. Um, so the, the survey fatigue is real. Um, they're voluntary data collections and, you know, they take a long time to do. The questions are really sensitive. Um, they ask difficult things and, and sometimes they're hard to answer, right? A question about how much did you spend for this boat on repair costs over the last year? Well, maybe you got the, the top of your mind. Maybe you need to ask your bookkeeper or pay your bookkeeper to look it up for you. Um, and certainly representativeness. So on, on the one hand, we have, um, you know, something like language barriers for, for minority populations. And if, if we're not doing everything we can to reach the folks who are hard to reach, um, we, we may not be representative. But also that our scientific staff um, certainly may not be diverse enough. And this is certainly a problem in economics. And if I, and, and you know, our, our group in SSB in, in the Northeast is fairly homogenous. Um, and this means that we maybe don't have the life experiences to ask the proper questions, or maybe we aren't interested in some of the questions that are really relevant to um, certain groups of people. Um, and also, we're, I think we're a little bit less diverse in training too. I don't think we, I think we, you know, we have three socioculturally trained staff um, in our group. And finally, you know, our regional data streams are regional, and that means that we, at least for the existing data collections, we have a pretty good handle of, um, you know, fishing revenues. When you send out a, when you when you fill in the, the dealer part, the the vessel uh, logbooks for our region. But you know, do we know where captains go for the months out of the year where they're not fishing in the Northeast? Um, are they fishing in different parts of the country? Um, what else are they working on? You know, these are things we don't quite know. I'm going to skip the slide except just to say don't forget about costs and I, I will I will end there. Thank you to the folks who helped helped us out or helped me out in putting this uh, presentation together. Thanks. Minyang, th thank you for a, um, a very honest and frank pr presentation. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions of clarification from the committee members. Sorry, while I'm trying to manage my screen. Lisa. Yeah, thanks. That was really, really interesting and I appreciate your candor. Um, I'm really interested in the oral history project that's been discontinued. But the specific question, the clarifying question is, you talked uh, on a slide about how it had been used to inform understanding. I think that was sort of, you know, broad understanding, but there was one point there would actually look like it informed a management decision or a take. I, I just missed the last point on that slide. You had understanding the role of gender, but it looked like there was actually a, a management, yeah. Oh, so to parameterize the stock assessment models. It if Matt McPherson is still on, I believe this is a Southeast um, that he might be able to chime in on this. 
And if not, we can, I can answer your question. Yeah, I'm still on. Uh, that is the uh, the best example that we have of the use of uh, the oral histories to actually inform a management decision. And um, the we you know we we conducted oral histories of people's experiences of red tide, you know, throughout their careers in the Gulf of Mexico and ask them for the locations and relative severity of the different red tide events. And that was used by the uh, stock assessment process to basically um, evaluate um, how, uh, or sort of compare the, uh, the severity of the uh, 2018 red tide events to some of the previous um, red tide events that, uh, you know, that we'd had earlier, I think 2004 and, and whatever. And so it, uh, it was used in, you know, in more of a qualitative way to, to give them, you know, an idea of how to evaluate the, the risk uh, to the uh, red grouper population that that red tide event represented. And there, there are a couple publications out that describe, you know, how that information was used in that stock assessment process. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Jim. You were next up. Sure, thank you very much. That was great. Um, you mentioned, you know, data efforts to collect information, demographics and others on vessel owners, crew and through the REC survey. Um, but I didn't hear any I, uh, mention of a report or anything that tried to synthesize the characteristics of all of them together. Like what is the overall picture uh, across the groups that you are collecting demographics versus sort of one-off reports on each, like here's the crew snapshot and a vessel owner snapshot. And what would be a vehicle to do that sort of overall picture and give you a sense of the, the true community associated with the fisheries, at least in what you're collecting information on? Um. Thanks, Jim. I, th I think you're correct, although I, I confess to be only, only being only an advanced amateur in this, um, <laughs> knowing what our group is working on. Um, and I can certainly find out if there's something that's kind of been pulled together that speaks a little more holistically. Grant? Microphone, please, Graham. Sorry, uh, thanks for me as well. Uh, I had a question about the uh, comment you made that the Northeast Council had asked what is happening on the EEJ uh, front. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what they asked for, if there was more detail on that or what the context was from that request. In the um, vein of, I, I will, I know Matt Cutler, and Rachel Feeney are both on, on this call. If they feel like they could answer that, um, I think they would be um, better positioned to. Sure. Did I unmute? Uh, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if Rachel's on. She could probably speak to this as well, but basically she and I, um, are coordinating on how to integrate our efforts um, stemming from the national level strategy, uh, NOAA fisheries strategy on equity and environmental justice, which was just released, uh, which is now moving to a uh, sort of um, uh, breakout of regional level um, implementation plans. Uh, and that's sort of how it'll be implemented. Um, but as Min Yang suggested, you know, staff uh, availability and resources are tight, <laughs> to say the least. And so at this point, it's been basically just uh, myself and Rachel in communication. At, uh, Rachel's at the New England Fisheries Management Council. I'm the uh, social sociologist at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, and uh, we're just, just, just starting to think about how to um, reach out 
sort of do in reach first. So, you know, make all of our staff aware across all of the branches and divisions and the council that we're trying to um, address this and then um, and then and then begin to engage with communities to um, to hopefully draw up a regional implementation plan and then to actually implement that plan. Um, and so, yeah, at this point, the council has been basically just at, right in the council represented by Rachel has been asking me for information about kind of where NOAA Fisheries is at in terms of the implementation of our strategy. Um, but we've yet to actually kind of move forward on um, any particular projects. However, I will say that, you know, in our work, at least for myself, I can say, and I know for Rachel as well, uh, but she can speak to this as well. Um, I incorporate, um, I've begun incorporating um, in my social impact assessments, a section on equity and environmental justice using, you know, the best available data, which is basically you know, some data from our crew survey that I lead, um, but also the social indicator project at the national level, um, the community social vulnerability indices that are basically um, census data combined with fishing um, industry data, um, looking at um, dimensions of, of social vulnerability at the community level. Um, th those are a, a useful source of information to sort of indicate where there may be equity and environmental justice concerns, but those aren't, um, you know, th th those are community level data, um, don't really speak to lived experiences very well. Um, you know, just aggregate level poverty indices and things like that. So anyway, I'll, I'll uh, defer to Rachel to, to sort of uh, end out if I missed anything. Rachel, please go ahead. Hi all, uh, I'm Rachel Feeney, staff at the New England Fishery Management Council. Um, glad to be listening in today. I'll just add um, uh, from the prior comments that about a year ago, all of the councils um, submitted comments or responses to the, the draft national EEJ strategy. Um, I can provide a copy of our letter um, to your staff if that would be helpful for your group to have that. And that, um, you know, we were, I guess, I would say that was the only formal um, request or response of the council itself, other than the staff to working together, as Matt just um, expounded on. And in that, um, you know, we were asking for more for help in identifying underserved. Fisheries management and, and consider equity more uh, better in the council process. Um, I'll dig out that letter and uh, send, it, send it in. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I see in the chat box that several people are having problems finding the raised hand function. Um, as guidance, I find mine under the reactions button. Um, if you don't see a reactions button, try looking under the three dots that say more. Um, and if you raise your hand, I'll certainly call upon you. Um, we're at that point in the agenda where I would like to broaden the discussion out to um to more general qu questions um and i'll start off and this people um from the agency may feel is above their pay grade but uh min yang you mentioned about the lack of a uh senior scientist for for social sciences um and it's clear from my experience that that for example, Jason Link, as senior scientist for ecosystem-based approaches, played a major role in moving e EBM or EBAFM, I think as it is within NOAA, th through the a a agency. Are there discussions about such a role for um, behavioral and social sciences? Um, yeah, let me be clear. There is a... a Economist at that level. Yes, right. Um, Doug Doug Lip, yep. Lip, Lipton serves in that role. Yep, um, and I, I I believe we were thinking even of the level above that, and 
<laughs> Way above my pay grade. <laughs> Other questions for our panelists? Don't be shy. Jim, and then Matt. Um, both of uh, the presentations discussed OMB and OMB's role in data collection, the Paper Reduction Act. And so maybe, you, can you elaborate a little bit um, because one of our tasks might be, for example, to recommend data sources or collection of new data. And so it'd be very valuable to get your impressions about uh, the OMB process and what that kind of recommendation might run up against. So just maybe talk from your experiences with OMB, the paper reduction and collecting this kinds of data. So I, I guess I'll I'll tackle that, but Jim, just to, yeah, th this is a tad uncomfortable of a discussion, even though we raised it. So we opened the door. So fair question. Um, I mean, I th you know, the bottom line for us is we can only collect what OMB says we can collect. So they are the final arbiter in the, these types of decisions. Um, you know, in terms of what I said in my presentation about mandatory collection of demographic and small business data, that from their perspective, I cannot speak on behalf of NIMS, NOAA, DOC in terms of what our perspective is. I'm not sure <laughs> that we have a finalized view on this, but their position is we do not have the legal authority to require fishermen to provide that information. Um, they were very strong in their feelings on this with regard to demographic data. And I think their, their general position is that only the Census Bureau has the ability to require anyone to provide demographic information. So that thus, I don't want to say that they're not supportive of us collecting it, but they're saying we're only going to be allowed to collect it on a voluntary basis. Um, and, you know, it's, I think we're all aware of the pitfalls of you know, requesting information on a voluntary basis, particularly when it's sensitive information and folks are not really wanting to provide it or, or they understand the purpose for which it's going to be used or they don't understand it. And it makes them, you know, reluctant to provide the information. Um, I mean, we, you know, we actually had a couple of calls with them. I think they very much understand why we want it, but the purposes that we want to use it for, for, from their perspective, do not outweigh the fact that they say we don't have the legal authority. So that's, you know, where do you go from there? I don't, <laughs> there is nowhere to go. From their perspective, the decision has been made and they're, they're not going to move from that. And in terms of the, the time delays, um, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, you know, it's generally related to staffing, you know, not, not just within our agency and, and the department, but actually at OMB as well, because of course they're not just reviewing PRA packages and not just for us, but for the entire, you know, federal government. Um, and then they also review all of our rulemakings as well. So I, I think that the delays there's not much we can do about the delays because I think it's partly due to staffing, particularly on their end. I'm not sure if that really fully answered your question, but. Thank you, Michael. Min Yang, I just want to offer you the chance to follow up seeing as you also talked about OMB and I assume that's why your hand is up. It is, thank you. Um, I will say one of the frustrations uh, for the economists is that uh, we've not been able to 
provide incentives for participation, which is like, that's what science says you should do um, for some of these things. Um, and it really, it makes our response rates lower. Um, it makes the survey more costly. Um, it seems like a, you know, unnecessary self-inflicted, you know, thing. Um, I would like to kick it over to, to Matt. Matt's um, got the crew survey in the field and he may have some, some thoughts to, Matt Cutler might have some good thoughts to share on this too. Sure thing. Um, thanks, Minyang. Yeah, just quickly, um, uh, the crew survey generally um, makes it through <laughs> the PRA process, uh, although we get some pushback sometimes on the types of questions we're asking and why they need to be asked. But this makes me think about um, a social capital, community social capital survey I was trying to field a few years back. And uh, you know, social capital being a, a key dimension um, in terms of uh, vulnerability um, uh, for underserved you know, uh, populations. And uh, wasn't able to field it. Um, and in one of my uh, calls with uh, the OMB and uh, OA, uh, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs uh, folks, the question was raised, uh, you know, kind of why why does NOAA Fisheries need to collect this information? Why couldn't this be collected by uh, another another agency or, or, or an external um, group, you know, university research uh, outfit or something like that? And, and I didn't have a great answer at the time, um, <laughs> but I think, um, you know, that's something to reflect on. It's, it's um, uh, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree. I just, I think that's a question that, that gets posed to us uh, when we put up for a information collection request is, you know, justify why NOAA Fisheries needs this information. And, and I think it's clear now, I mean, at the time we weren't as heavily involved in equity and environmental justice sort of strategies as we are now, uh, given the executive orders. Um, um, but, you know, I think that, um, yeah, yeah, it, if, if I were to resubmit that, I, I'd have a better answer for them. But um, that, that's one of those questions that comes up. Thank you. Uh, Matthew McPherson, were you hand raised in a similar response? Uh, well, I wanted to comment on a number of different things. I'm not sure if this is the time. <laughs> uh, if it was in response to Jim's question, please go ahead. If not, I'll go. There are others. The specific question was about OMB and, and PRA. Yeah. 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 So my my comment there is, you know, it's it is possible to get approval to, you know, use incentives. We are um, providing incentives, for example, for the focus groups for EEJ. We are. Um, it does look like we're going. To, we were approved to provide incentives for a, a survey that we're implementing on recreational fisheries. Um, so if you have enough time you can get things through PRA. The issue with PRA is it makes it extremely, it's a very extremely slow, long and tedious bureaucratic process to get approval for any kind of sociocultural data collection. And just an example of, of that is that we get hit with disasters and we're mandated to do, um, you know, disaster assessments within a short period of time. The laws changed a little bit, so, that might not be quite as relevant as it was before, but there was no way to get any sort of rapid PRA approval to do, you know, surveys to be able to assess, you know, what economic damages were and things like that. It easily takes a year or more to get any sort of approval to do any kind of a, of a survey. So, you know, you can hammer your way through it and keep going back and forth and waiting and so forth. And eventually it shows up but it just makes it really t difficult to the, I think, you know, the, e the current EEJ situation is also an example of that where, I mean, it became a priority. It would be great to be able to get some surveys out in the field, but to get that through PRA, you know, could take us, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, a huge battle even to be able to do focus groups, let alone put together some sort of a quantitative survey and get that approved. So, that's been the experience, you know, that we've had with uh, dealing with OMB and PRA. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to turn back to members of the committee. Uh, Matt, you were next in the queue. 
Yeah, thanks. I actually had a, my, my question was similar in vain to Jim's, and I guess I'm just trying to update it here now that I've heard some responses, but I guess I'm wondering to what extent could NOAA and their data collection efforts be linked to other data collection efforts by other agencies like Census, BLS, um, IRS, and, and so forth. So it wouldn't be NOAA collecting that information directly, but at least being able to link it to other collection efforts. Uh, and I guess that's a question to anyone who can speak to that. Uh, Michael, Michael Travis, was that in response? Yes. So <clears throat> I'm going to preface my response by saying I am speaking on my own behalf and my response may <clears throat> not sit too well with some of my colleagues, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, so here's the issue that that idea has been in the works for at least a couple of years now. And I understand it conceptually. In practical terms, for those of us who for many years have attempted to merge data sets in one way or another, particularly multiple data sets over a period of time, and it gets, and that that's just within the agency. It's difficult. It's very difficult to merge different data sets collected by different parts of the agency, different offices, different management structures, the, the whole thing. When you start talking about data sets across agencies, uh, that to me is not a winning proposition. Um, it is, it is going to be very difficult to merge, for an example, demographic data, because demographic data is at the individual level, right? So you're trying to merge information about individuals across multiple data sets across multiple agencies. In order to do that, you have to have a way to do the linking. The best choice, the, the best unique identifier for you know, individuals is going to be a social security number. But social security numbers are PII. That it's probably the most sensitive piece of information, whether it's us or census or whoever, that we collect. And not every NIMS office actually collects social security numbers on their permit holders. So I understand that there are projects that are trying to look at this. I personally am not having high hopes that it will be successful. But again, just my opinion. And I'm sure others will disagree so they can speak to their view. Thank you, Michael. Um, Clifford Hutt, was your hand up in response to this? Um, hi, yes, this is Clifford Hutt with uh, NOAA Fisheries Office of Sustainable Fisheries. Um, so one thing I wanted to bring up, and it was kind of related to this as well as some of the other things we were discussing earlier, um, a lot of these issues aren't just associated with PRA, but they are associated with the Privacy Act, which OMB is keeping close in mind through their PRA approval process now. Uh, much more now than they had in the past. And most of these questions of demographics and all are kind of protected under the Privacy Act. And there's specific language in that act that basically says all these collections are voluntary unless they may, may be listed as mandatory if the person is required by law to provide the data and the person is subject to a penalty for refusing. Um, and we've got a lot of language in Magnuson about requirements for providing fishery specific data, but you know nothing specifically to demographics. So I think that's kind of the issue there. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. And you know, there's a lot of regarding this question of data sharing. There's a lot in the Privacy Act about sharing of this kind of data in between agencies or outside of the federal government. And so there's just a lot of layers of approval 
that have to go on that just make getting that information difficult. I also want to mention something about incentives. Um, that's something that we have been looking into for because of a recent rulemaking, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from on that from our general counsel. Basically, the the thing is is they have to be fairly small. You know, it's it's difficult to get approval for providing incentives of significant amounts, especially if you're proposing to do things like random drawings to determine who gets it, because that's too similar to a lottery, which the federal government's not allowed to do. Um, but one case where they were improved and one of our approved for one of our economic data collections with uh, was out of the Southwest Fishery Science Center. They eventually got approval to provide literally $2 in cash in every envelope for their economic survey that went out because they did a series of pilot studies that took a couple of years to complete that basically demonstrated that it was cheaper to conduct the survey if they stuck $2 in every envelope because it increased the response rate that much versus just sending out envelopes with no cash. <laughs> but that's what they had to do to get approval and that it took it took a couple of extra years to the PRA process to get that approval. <laughs> so, yeah, and that wouldn't even get you a cup of coffee at St Starbucks anymore. Um, uh, Lisa, uh, th first of all, Clifford, thanks very much for your comments. Lisa, you were up next. Yeah, um, I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'll just preface this by saying that I'm a social scientists sympathetic to qualitative methods. Um, so both of you talked about the oral histories. Um, it, it sounded to me, I don't wanna read too much into it with some uh, regret that it's not gonna be funded any further. Um, there's the focus group process going on. And um, particularly uh, Min Yang, you talked about the difficulties of uh, using qualitative data and integrating it into the management process. And I guess I would love to hear more about what, how those particular types of data collection efforts that look quite different than the other ones, how they get started, what people see the value of, or how the value is conceptualized um, from the get-go. What is the purpose of them when they start? Um, if there is this sense that is there an ambition to influence management or are they seen as different things? I guess I'm just getting wanting to elaborate a little bit more on like what's the logic of them in the first place? Uh, are there ambitions to influence management? Yeah, not well articulated, but I think you know what I mean. Let's go first to Michael Travers, seeing you were the first one to bring the Noah Voices project up. Um, an ambition in that data collection series to uh, feed into to management or uh, a broader goal of, of simply describing the state of affairs? So again, since I am not one of the people who write social impact assessments, I'm going to defer to Christina and or Ed if they would like to speak to this issue. Yeah, sorry, this is- Christina, go ahead. I I mean, I think we can definitely use, you know, the oral histories that we've collected to inform like our understanding of fishing practices, things like how recreational fishing is done, day trips, things like that, as well as, I mean, Matt mentioned, you know, the red tide interviews specifically and that feeding into management. But I don't know if Ed wants to expand on that or even Patricia Pinto de Silva, if you're on here too. Patricia? I'll invite you to respond. 
Patricia, you're on mute still. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about how oral history um, serves um, the fisheries management process um, as it relates to equity and in environmental justice. I, mean, I think, you know, a lot of people have said that there's a lack of, of data, which there is. There's also a lack of training and understanding. So some things aren't just like, oh, I can create a graph out of this and pull it into a social impact assessment. Part of it is capacity building. Our offices are in places that aren't co-located with underrepresented communities. The individuals that we are, we're not necessarily in the field. We don't know people. We're not asking questions. We're not at the kitchen tables. This is an opportunity from anybody from a brand new person walking in to their new job at NOAA Fisheries to a, our AA to listen, learn, and reflect uh, um, and just and raise awareness of who are our stakeholders, what are the realities, how might they be impacted by uh, changes in management decisions. So it, it's not just about like, how can we package this and then put it in to serve decision making? It's more, how can we learn from this to make better decisions? And then we can also use it to write better impact um, assessments. If we're only reliant on counting the number of things, it's like, you know, having a library, but not being able to read the books. These are the books. These are very intimate descriptions of, let's say, a processing worker in New Bedford, um, what their life is like, not necessarily talking about impact assessments, but then you can look at what's about to change in the pathway of their work and have a much better sense of how that person's life might be impacted. You understand their you know, ability to speak English. You understand their background, religion, culture, values, et cetera, in a way that we just can't get from the other types of information that we have. Thank you, Patricia. That, that was a very helpful answer. Um, Lisa, follow up or visit your hand. Um, then Stephen, you're next on my list of speakers. Stephen Skyfus. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one was motivated by Min Yang's presentation. And uh, really what I'm, I'm curious about builds upon the, the, the question that Lisa just asked and, and some of the responses, but we've heard a lot of terms around port or community or place-based elements. And I was curious, you know, generally how some of the various data sets that have been mentioned, like the NOAA social indicators that are very spatially explicit, might interplay with some of the, the more survey or permit application type information collected. So if you're collecting information on, you know, principal port or landings port, if you could just talk a little bit about how those data may ever be described spatially um, or any challenges, you know, that you run into with saying something about a particular place from both, you know, the large scale social indicators that were made for that type of scale versus some of the, the other data sets that, that you guys are collecting directly through permits or forms um, or surveys. Yeah, so our logbook data contains where, where, where fish were landed. Our dealer data contains where, um, both where fish were landed and where the dealers are located. Um, our, our operator permits, I believe, have a mailing address. Um, our, so all of these things can be used to attribute fishing activity stuff to a geograph geography on land. Um, I know we talked about mailing, uh, the panel's heard about the mailing addresses versus, you know, home addresses issue. It, it, um, so that, that certainly is one, right? Um, not every mailing address is a home address. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of the state of play. One of the, one of the frustrations or the, one of the difficulties is that um, we've historically collected, you know, port information is kind of like, write down what you want. And in New England, there are lots of names for various little geographies. <laughs> Um, so someone, just to give a case in point, might write down Woods Hole, which is kind of in the same town as Falmouth. They might also write down, I don't know, McGansett Harbor or something like that. And these are all kind of within a couple couple miles of each other. And so figuring out what is a, how to define the place on land has always been a little challenging. 
Um, we also have fishing location information, so we can talk about communities at sea. Um, Kevin St. Martin has done some incredible work in that in that front. Um, I think that's how we are for or where we are in terms of geographies. Stephen, follow up. If, if I could, I was going to ask a second um, different question. I didn't know if any of the Southeast folks' hands were up to respond to that first one. Matthew McPherson, was that in response? On yes. So we have a, um, I think, you know, Min Yang covered it pretty well, but we have, you know, vessel monitoring system information, at least for the Gulf of Mexico, um, our spatial information um isn't nearly as good for the uh, South Atlantic or Caribbean regions, but for the Gulf of Mexico, we can connect, you know, fishing locations to specific communities. And right now we are in the process of doing that. We're doing, you know, working on kind of a communities at sea, you know, process. Um, and we're, we're definitely trying to link up the social indicators, you know, at the community level with um, actual, you know, fishing activities and areas you know, at sea in the Gulf, and we're going to do our best um, in the other uh, in the other regions. Thank you, Michael Travis. Was your hand up in response to Stephen's original question? No, it, it was actually in response to an earlier question. Is it okay if I respond to that previous question? Sure. So, and I, and I honestly, I apologize, I don't recall who raised this issue, but, but someone asked about basically, is there a repository of some sort where all this information that Min Yang and I and others have been talking about can be found and stored so it's not, you know, <laughs> haphazard is the only word that comes to mind where, you know, little bit of information here, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. And then it's just this huge process of trying to pull it all together. And, you know, one, at least in theory, place where that could be done is in safe reports. Um, you know, safe reports are intended to be a repository for um, all sorts of information, whether it's social, economic, biological, that then, again, in theory, could be used when we are pulling together our management documents. And I can't speak for the Northeast. I don't know what the Northeast is currently doing or what it did in the past. Um, we used to do safe reports in the Southeast many years ago. Um, I bet it's been at least 15 years since we did a safe report. And again, this is this is an issue of staffing and resources where uh, safe reports, particularly when you need to do them for every fishery across three councils, is, is a huge undertaking. Um, and you know, the decision has been made that we just we don't have the resources to pull safe reports together on a regular ongoing basis. It's unfortunate. Um, but, but that is the situation as it stands right now. I will mention the South Atlantic Council is interested in starting them back up, but whether the council is in the best position to be pulling lots of information from lots of sources uh, together for that purpose, I question that somewhat since NIMS we're the collectors and managers of the data. So we'll see how it goes, but they're going to take a stab at it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Stephen, you had a second question. I will hold my second question to pass to other committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Rachel, you're next. Yeah, um, thanks to you both and everyone on the call for walking us through so much valuable information. Um, Michael, I thought I heard you say in your present, I wanted to kind of tease apart the difference here and get um, your respective 
reflections on the difference between um, collecting information on permit applications or, or vessel-based information and quota holders. And I thought I heard um, Michael say that IFQ holders weren't covered by the permit application form. So they were, so you're kind of delving into that now. And I wanted to get Min Yang's reflection on that well. Do you, do you guys feel you have adequate data on quota holders and, and what does that data look like right now? So I'll, I'll jump in on that just to clarify a few points. So it's a mixed bag with regard to our quota shareholders. For those shareholders who still have permits, they are covered by our data collection on the permit application forms. But over the years, because of various regulatory changes that have been made, you can now be a shareholder in our IFQ programs, but not actually be a fisherman. So you don't, you know, you don't have to fish anymore, which means you don't need a fishing permit. Um, and so that, that the, the percentage of shareholders uh, that do not have permits has increased over time. And so that's when we realized we now have this much bigger hole in our data uh, with regard to are these shareholders who are not permit holders, you know, what are their demographics? Are they small businesses? Um, and as I mentioned, we wanted to add those questions to the, the shareholder account application form and we got denied. So it's still, we have the demographic information, small business data on the shareholders who are also permit holders. We do not have it at all for the shareholders who do not have permits. So it's, that's not a, a good situation. And as a quick follow-up to that, Michael, do you know which per, do you know the percentage of quota holders that don't have permits? Like, is that is that a known? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do this off the top of my head, and Christina, if you remember better than I do, but I want to say it's about a third. So it's about two to one. I think about two thirds still have a permit or are somehow associated with a permit, and about a third are not. But of course, it's not so much, I mean, yes, the proportions are important, but there's no way for us to say, at least I, I haven't been able to come up with one, uh, you know, how applicable, you know, let me put it a different way, how different the shareholders without permits are in terms of demographics from the shareholders who do have permits they could be very different in terms of their demographics, but there's just no way to know that at this point. So I have not been willing to apply any of the information that we collected on those who are permit holders to those who are not. I just, I don't think there's a basis for doing that. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna uh, go to Kaylin next. Great. So my question relates back to the OMB process. And uh, I, I'm thinking back to the presentations, and I'm pretty sure that there was a point made that the Southeast survey was of uh, crew was based on the Northeast uh, version of the crew survey. And generally here, I think something we're wrestling with is more of a place-based process, something that is specific to the fisheries that um, or the participants that may be being surveyed. But then I'm wondering if there's a trade-off and if that trade-off is with the speed of OMB. So I'm wondering if folks on the call can talk a little bit. Um, I saw there was a comment in the chat that I thought was really interesting um, that there was a generic clearance process and folks thought that made things go faster. And so if maybe people could comment a little bit on whether they think there would be utility to developing a more generalized sort of set of questions that could be asked 
um, across different regions and if that's underway or not. Matthew, was your hand up in response? Oh, yes. So the question, the answer to that question is yes. That that's exactly what we've done. Um, the Southeast Crew Survey was inspired by the Northeast Survey. We've matched up the questions. Of course, there are some there are some uh, differences. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know that require that we ask certain questions differently in the different regions. But for the most part, there we we uh, combined efforts in terms of putting together uh, a PRA renewal package, and so um, the surveys that cover the the you know the East Coast as well as all of the South Atlantic are all under one um, you know PRA clearance, and there are a set of questions that you can select from, um, you know, in order to put together you know your survey for uh, you know. Um, a crew survey, basically, at least for our different regions. So, you know, we did that both because we want to have a common set of metrics that covers, you know, this whole large area of the United States to be able to compare and understand, you know, how crew, you know, are similar and different in different areas. Um, and we also did that strategically to um, expedite the PRA process. Danica Kleiber, was your hand up in response to this question? Uh, yes, good morning from Honolulu. Uh, you should also, uh, related to that question in particular, there's also an attempt um, with NOS. So this is a, a NOAA level attempt to create um, a wider question bank. It's ongoing, it's been taking several years, um, but there is an attempt to get some of these basic questions um, as, a, as a whole package. Thank you, Danica. Kaylin, follow up? Yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the stage of that work and if if that's something that we could get a presentation about or if there's any sort of written documentation of what that list of questions might be as of today. Sure, so Danielle Schwartzman of NOS, one of their head economists would be the one to ask. She's been leading this effort. Um, it does include uh, demographic questions because I wrote them. Um, it also <laughs> includes uh, uh, sociocultural questions. And in particular, there was a section on EEJ because we knew this was coming down. Um, because it's NOS, there's a lot of questions related to access to beaches, et cetera. Um, but there are fisheries related questions as well. So uh, Danielle Schwartzman, be the one to contact. And Danica, can I just confirm that was D Danielle Schwartz? Schwartzman. Schwartzman, thank you very much. Um, Matt, Matt Reimer. Yeah, so I've got a question that's probably not likely easy to answer, um, but it's been highlighted in, it was highlighted in both Minyang's and Michael's presentation, and it's a challenge that as a committee we've been grappling with, and it, it's with respect to the fact that all data collection um, efforts right now are based on people or individuals or communities that are currently engaged in fisheries. And when it comes to equity, one thing that we're um, usually thinking about is um, opportunities to participate in fisheries or particularly issues with respect to access. And so what that means is that we're missing out on would-be individuals or communities uh, who would be participating in some counterfactual world. And so I guess I'm wondering how you guys think about that in terms of the scope of um, people impacted or could be beneficiaries to fisheries when thinking about your EEJ um, strategies. And you thought it was appropriate to say might be difficult to answer. <laughs> I, I think people are, are uh, choosing to, to leave that hot, hot potato, but it has been a, a question we've really struggled with. 
um, and it's a question of how it fits into our charge, if, if at all. And and we recognise this is one of the most challenging parts of the charge that we have is is what would fisheries look like through a more holistic e e equity lens if we were starting with a blank canvas rather than the the canvas that we have all right so now we've got some responses time to think um hearing new voices edward glazier first hi folks can you hear me and see me yes we can oh good okay yeah, that's a great question and, and a philosophically difficult one. But I, and I think it is a, a, an empty slate at the moment empirically. But we're just kicking off these uh, EEJ focus groups and, and some uh, related conversations with folks, uh, underserved populations. So I think we may have something to say there eventually, but literally, if we're just getting off the ground, I've got to do some interviews in the next couple of weeks and, and um, I think we could touch upon that um, in some of the conversations. These are open-ended open conversations associated with uh, um, focus group research. So. Is that in a specific, specific region or yeah, yeah. targeting specific fisheries? Right. Um, we're getting ready to do some work um, in rural North Carolina. So we're having a little bit of a challenge identifying participants, but um, and getting them to agree to come to distant meetings, but I, I think we're going to succeed to some extent, and uh, that issue would certainly be a useful one to pursue um, during the Thank work. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Um, Matt Cutler and then Christina Package-Ward. Matt. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to the question of opportunities. Um, so, uh, there, there's a couple of ways to answer it. So one would be um, in the equity and environmental justice national strategy. We definitely outline this as a goal to sort of widen the net and find out who we've been trying to sort of answer the question of the unknown unknown, like how, we, who have we been missing in our data collections? Um, and this might help speak to if we can actually um, address that and, and actually implement that with some projects that can get out in the field and, and actually find folks who, who um, either lack opportunities or are connected to folks who might lack opportunities. Um, that would that would be one way um, to try to begin to answer that. But then also, I wanted to mention um, that in my sort of uh, ongoing uh, travels for uh, the current crew survey that I'm fielding um, in the Northeast region, I've spoken to a number of uh, crew who have mentioned uh, you know it's a common sort of refrain when we have a question regarding whether or not the crew would uh, advise young folks to get into fishing and whether they would do it if they had their life to live over again. And, and they say, you know, I don't know, I don't know that I could, I don't know that anyone young um, or, or new to the industry could even conceive of getting into it because you either have to know, um, you have to be well connected or you have to have tons of uh, financial <laughs> capital to, to, to begin to, to, you know, buy a vessel and, and get permits and, and get invested in the fishery. Um, so they feel as though opportunities are just, you know, off the table for a new quote unquote generation of, of fishers. Um, and that's something I hear all the time. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Christina. I was just going to mention that in addition to the EEJ focus groups that we're doing in the Southeast, um, we're also doing a series, I think of eight IFQ focused focus groups. And these are looking at creating a tool, um, I guess that would provide access to purchase shares and allocations to so some sort of marketplace tool. So that is specifically looking at access, but it is the focus group members will include folks that are already involved in the IQ process, but the idea is to give them better access to purchasing shares and allocation. Thank you, Christina. Matt, does that give you enough to be going on with, or do you want to? That's good. Jim wanted to follow. Jim. Yeah, thanks. I I appreciate that uh, the unknown unknown comment. I think that makes it every single meeting I've attended in Washington D.C. over the last 
15 years or 20 years since Rumsfeld said it. But what about the non, the known unknowns? A lot of these IFQ catch share programs, for example, exclude individuals early on, like the groundfish snapper in the Southeast or the Gulf, right? There was a lot of vessels that were removed from the fishery prior to the catch share allocation. Has anybody done studies to understand how, what happened to those individuals that were not part of the catch share, but were actually operating in the fisheries prior? There were more small scale operators, of course, but do you guys have some examples of that maybe uh, in either of your regions? Min Yang? Yeah, um, so for the IFQ scalp fishery, um, as part of the five-year review, there was some detailed analysis of folks who did not qualify for IFQ scallops. So we, we looked at um, what vessels and firms were doing, um, you know, what were they fishing for, um, and that kind of activity. Um, but that was on the, the firm level and did not go down to the people level. Anyone else have questions? Rashid, welcome. Yeah, uh, yeah. there's so many of them, right? <laughs> yeah, I have to learn them, yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving me the floor. And sorry, I had to get, I uh, got here late. I mean, I was supposed to be in DC yesterday and flight problems, so at least I'm here. Yeah, and when I came in, uh, there was a lot of talk and about the obstacles and the barriers, you know, whether it is privacy issues, when we're talking about the OMB. And I was sitting here thinking, my God, how do we, I guess the committee will have to really struggle with how to tackle some of these obstacles. But I thought you guys have been thinking and working with this forever, right? For a long time. So what are your ideas of the going through all these barriers, you know, the silos, the privacy issues and all that? Any, any ideas you can share with us on your thoughts on how to deal with this, you know? <laughs> Difficult? No, it's Patricia? Hi. Um, great question, Rashid. And I think I'm also speaking to the question that came just before about blank slate and opportunities and possibilities. And I would just encourage the committee to think about whether or not the current council system is a system that is a just system that is focusing on the distributional benefits of fisheries to society. The definition of national standard one optimum yield is the benefits to society in terms of food production and recreational opportunities. We've been focusing here a lot on the underrepresented communities that are engaged in the supply chain process, but not um, the, but that don't really participate and we don't have enough information on. But there's also those benefits and who's mm -hmm. not benefiting where we have so much of our fish being landed and turned into exports immediately. Mm -hmm. It raises to question who is not benefiting from this extraordinarily unique and nutritionally rich food source mm -hmm. that we are giving away. You're not giving away, we're selling. But yeah. um, it raises equity questions that I'm not hearing being considered here about um, food deserts, uh, food sovereignty, food security, um, access to fresh fish, and mm. the choices that we make as a society, more specifically as a regional council, in how our fish is used. And I think that a lot of people, people on this call might say, well, the, the council doesn't decide that. But 
they do make decisions that impact what fish can be used for once it's landed. It impacts the shape and form distribution of where it's landed um, and how it can be used. So uh, if I were to had a blank slate, I would think about the ship that we're on and think about how we might be able to redesign the ship in a way that is more equitable and more likely to achieve those national standard one benefits that we want. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a moment. I thought maybe there was going to be a little bit of a, a gap um, while people were uh, determining whether or not they wanted to respond to that last question. I wanted to just remind folks that um, you know, we do have this discussion session. We will also have another one after we hear from some more of the science centers. Um, so I, I first want to thank the folks that have joined us this morning, um, particularly those that presented and also those that have clearly joined us from um, further west as well. I know for some of you, this is exceptionally early in the morning. Um, and I want to just, you know, send my appreciation for you all being on the line and also um, ask that you all give some thought to some of these questions that are being asked now because they will likely be raised again in our later discussion session with some of the other presenters. So um, I just wanted to um, sort of remind folks that there is that opportunity to, to resurrect some of these discussions um, uh, later on our agenda as well and also um, thank the folks that I see following along with us from, from pretty far out west, given the, the time difference. So um, I won't keep us, we've, we've got a, a few more hands raised and I know that we are getting up against our agenda time. So um, I will turn it back to you, John. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm not sure if this is a, an obnoxious question or not, so I apologize in advance, but, you know, hearing the very real barriers to collecting this type of data at the federal level, is there any opportunity or has, has this already been explored to um, leverage or partner with um, state departments, like state collected data? I'm thinking like workforce development type data. Um, is that, I, I, I hear the concerns around trying to merge these uh, federal data sets, but has that been explored at all? Or is there any opportunity within your regions to kind of push on that? Clifford, your hand was up remarkably fast as Rachel asked that question. So I'll, I'll go over to you. There is a lot of sensitivities about PRA and working with folks that the PRA doesn't apply to. Um, you know, it's, it's a federal statute. It does not apply to state agencies, but we could certainly use the data they get, but the issue comes in when we start talking with them and making suggestions about what to collect, like commonly with academic researchers. If we put out an RFP, and say, we're looking for proposals on subjects A, B, and C. Uh, and someone submits a proposal to do a study, and as part of that study, they propose conducting a survey. And we didn't specifically say, we need you to conduct a survey in the RFP, but that was their proposal. That survey doesn't need PRA approval if we fund it, so long as we don't then go in there in the contract and stipulate that this survey must X, X, Y, and Z and give them too much input. You know, we just kind of have to let them do their thing and it doesn't have to worry about PRA. But if we try to put out an RFP where we specifically say, we need you to conduct a survey and it needs to collect this kind of data, well, now that survey needs to be PRA approved. So there's there's just all kinds of, legal sensitivities with that. And and depending on what lawyer you talk to, they may tell you, even if you fund, say, one of those proposals where it was the researcher's idea, they may tell you, if you want to avoid PRA, then you can't even talk to them about what they're going to ask. They have to just do it completely independently. But you get different level of advice on that. It gets to be a bit of a gray area. Um, but one thing I put in the comments, if you're really interested in getting into PRA difficulties and where a lot of the bottlenecks are, 
Adrian Thomas is the NOAA PRA coordinator. So she sees all the PRA difficulties we have, and she's the one who's always interacting with OMB, uh, coordinating with them on all these. She could be a wealth of knowledge for those questions, although she might be very sensitive about, you know, how she answers certain things. But, you know, she sees kind of really all the issues that are where, you know, we're having snags with PRA at the agency because they all go through her, every one of them. Thank you, Clifford. And I'll give the last question to Kaylin. Kaylin? Yeah, I wasn't sure what we're putting in the chat versus asking out loud. And I appreciated Patricia's point. Is she, did she drop off though? Is she still there? Um, well, so my more general question was about the broader sort of flow of benefits that Patricia raised. And I just wanted to follow up and ask her if there were particular um, papers or other types of written products where she feels like that type of consideration has been done because that's something that we're thinking about. What are the different potential categories of beneficiaries and potential flows of benefits from fisheries? So for her or anyone else on the call, if, um, if there are particular references, that would be helpful for us to have a look at. Fortunately, I don't see her on the call. Yeah. Um, Michael, your hand is up. Is it in response to Rachel's question? Because I saw it come up that time. Yeah, that, that is correct. And Rachel, I, I, I wanted to clarify exactly what you were asking. It, it sounded like you were you were wondering if there is state collected and managed data that we can make use of that maybe we aren't making use of at this time, but I wasn't quite sure what, what kind of data you were thinking about, but I'll make a few general comments about state data um, because we have a very different situation, particularly between the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. So, there are cooperative data sharing agreements between the agency and the states on the East Coast. Um, we do get a fair amount of data collected from the states or managed by the states when it comes to, you know, trip tickets, you know, which is your basic landings and revenue data and, and some effort information. We get uh, individual fishermen license data. We can get boat registration data. And all of that can generally be obtained via ACCSP, which is the Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Statistics Program. In the Gulf, it's not that simple. Uh, the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission Although they do hold uh, state trip ticket data, they do not maintain fishermen license data from the states. They do not maintain boat registration data from the states. They, it's just not the same kind of expansive data repository as what we have on the East Coast. Um, and I know from personal experience, uh, it is, you know, you talk about OMB and the PRA clearance process, uh, you know, going to each of the individual states in the Gulf to ask for data that they don't share as a, as a matter of due course is another lengthy and difficult <laughs> process. Um, and I mean, I, I'm not aware of them collecting anything like demographic information. And I, I think if we were to go beyond the state fisheries agencies, I doubt if we'd get anywhere with other state agencies. It's hard enough pure procuring just basic information from the state fisheries agencies. And some of them have reported to me that they have difficulty getting, you know, information they want from their fellow, you know, other state agencies. So 
I think I understand your point conceptually, but again, it just sounds like a very laborious process because the data sharing infrastructure is really not there, particularly in the Gulf. Hopefully that addresses your question. All right, well, I'm gonna draw on a line under this morning's discussions. Um, I wanna thank all um, who participated remotely on Zoom for a very full and candid discussion. I want to thank um, the committee members for their, their uh, insightful questions. We're going to break for lunch. We will be back at one o'clock in this room with presentations from Dale Squires from the Southwest uh, Fisheries Science Center and Leif Anderson uh, from the Northwest, Justin Hospital from Pacific Islands, and Brian garber yontz from Alaska. Um, so we have a full afternoon uh, starting again at one o'clock. Um, the uh, uh, Zoom link is available on the National Academy's website for this uh, uh, committee. And I again want to thank all of you for your participation today. Um, if anything springs to mind, um, please don't hesitate to contact Stacy, the program director, who will serve as the conduit to getting information to the committee members themselves. So thank you all very much, um, and we'll adjourn for lunch. Thank you. Um, this is Tom Miller, um, chair of the committee. We've got about a minute to go to a one o'clock start. Um, if anyone needs to test their audio, particularly if any of the presenters want to do an audio check before we start, this would be a good time to do it. Aloha, this is Justin Hospital. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, Justin. Yes, we can. Thumbs up. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, Brian Garbarian's here. Can you hear me? Thank you, Brian. We can hear you as well. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is one o'clock. Uh, my name is Tom Miller. I am chair of the uh, Academy's consensus study on assessing equity in the distribution of fishery management benefits. Um, this is our fifth meeting as a committee, although our first one in person. Um, we are going to start the session by just going around the committee members and allowing each to give a brief introduction. And then we have um, four presentations this afternoon between one o'clock and 3.05. We will build a break into the schedule um, before the panel discussion at 3.05. Um, and then we'll come back for the last sort of 45 minutes or so for um, this broader panel discussion. So thank you all for joining us, um, starting the introductions with myself. Uh, my name is Tom Miller. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, Chesapeake Biological Lab. <laughs> We're gonna need a shorter name at some point than that. Um, I'm a fishery scientist by training. Um, I serve on the Mid-Atlantic uh, Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee, and I'm also a member of the Ocean Studies Board. Kayla. Great, thanks, Tom. I'm an assistant professor of environmental and resource economics at Arizona State University. I'm in the School of Sustainability, and I'm also on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council Scientific and Statistical Committee. And I'm so sorry, I left, I didn't do my video, but I can see everyone on the big. Rashid, you next, please.
same thing, no, no video yet. So I'm Rashid Smiler, uh, professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, I'm jointly appointed at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And uh, I'm an economist by training, but this is, I call myself an interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economist. Yeah, just to, to, to show that I enjoy working in groups like this where many of us come together, pull our minds together to try to solve a fisheries problem. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Jim. <laughs> Jim Sankirko, Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis, and a member of the Ocean Studies Board. Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an Associate Professor of Marine and Environmental Sciences and Sociology at the University of South Alabama, and I'm on the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council's SSC. Rachel. Good afternoon, uh, Rachel Donkerslot. Uh, my background's in cultural anthropology, and I work and live in Alaska in the North Pacific. Thank you, Rachel. Lisa. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Campbell. I'm a social scientist and a professor at the Duke University Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina, and I'm also a member of the Ocean Studies Board. Grant. Yeah, greetings everyone. I'm Grant Murray, also at the Duke University Marine Lab. Uh, I'm a marine social scientist with uh, training in anthropology and sociology. Matt. Good afternoon. Uh, Matt Reimer at University of California, Davis in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. Uh, also a member of the Scientific and Statistical Committee for the Pacific Council. Thank you, Matt. Um, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy Karras. I'm a senior program officer with the Ocean Studies Board uh, and staff with the National Academies and the study director for this committee. Thank you, Stacy. Leanne? Hi, my name is Leanne. I'm an associate program officer with the Ocean Studies Board and the National Academies um, and helping with the study. Thank you, Leanne. Eric? Thank you very much. Um, so as I said, um, we are welcoming uh, a number of people from different science centers around the nation um, to talk to the committee. Uh, we've given them five sort of guiding questions um, that hopefully help them structure the kind of information we were looking for. We, held, we uh, heard from Michael Travis at the Southeast Center this morning uh, Min Yang Lee from the Northeast Center. Uh, we will hear from the other science centers uh, this afternoon. And we're going to start um, in the Southwest with Dale Squires. Dale? Tom, I'm not seeing Dale on the line just yet. We've sent him an email to see if he's having any, having any difficulty joining. Okay. Um, We I see Leaf is on. Let's give Dale just a minute or two. Um, and if not, we'll change the order around so we don't lose too much time. I, I will say while we're waiting for those um, on the Zoom audience, um, if you wish to respond to a comment or a question from someone on the committee, please use the raise hand feature, uh, which on Zoom you can find under the reactions tab. Um, feel free also to use the chat function. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and so your chats will be recorded as well. It's sometimes helpful if there are particular uh, reports or, or particular people you think the committee should talk to, um, to have details of those in the chat so that we um, don't misspell someone's name or, or get the report wrong. Um, so feel free, please, to use those features of Zoom as well. And while we're waiting for Dale to try and join, um, in summary of, of this morning's 
sessions, we heard a lot about the challenges of collecting uh, socio environment, socio ecological and economic data related both to the practical difficulties um, related perhaps to the Paperwork Reduction Act on the Pr Privacy Act but also the sort of scientific challenges of designing surveys and collecting information, um, particularly of those who have not traditionally been involved in fishery management process, uh, questions of how do you identify such potential participants? How, how do you build trust with those communities uh, to gain the kind of information um, that the agency would need to make an assessment of uh, the extent to which the distribution of fisheries management benefits is e equitable. So um, Stacey, I'm gonna suggest given that we're eight minutes past that we shift on and move to the second person on our agenda, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think that would be great, Leif, if you're, if you're um ready and available to go ahead. We'll, we'll put you now and then we'll um, have Dale next if we're okay. able to get him on the line. So then um, now first agenda is Leif Anderson from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, Leif, if you could uh, give us your presentation, I would appreciate it. Thank yes. you very much. Yes, absolutely. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. And your presentation is up, but it is not there. It is. It's now in full screen mode. Thank you very much. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, so I, let me preface this by saying that I am one of the two social science leads at the center. Unfortunately, Dan Holland could not make it. And I've also been in this position uh, leading our group for a relatively short amount of time. So um, if if we have in-depth questions on some of the data collections or issues I might have to admittedly follow up um, with, with you all later. So my 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 first thought here is that I, I did have an initial question about the study baseline or one might refer to as a counterfactual. So uh, two of the four sort of aims here very specifically call out the benefits of fishery management rather than perhaps the benefits of fishing under current fishery management. And I, <clears throat> and maybe it's a semantic question and um, maybe not important <clears throat> for the purposes of this discussion here, but I did want to acknowledge that there's a difference between um, those two framings. And I, and I wasn't exactly certain which of the two we were supposed to take, but I think we're leaning more on the benefits of fishing under current fishery management. Um, but I guess it depends on the, the particulars of the questions being asked. So I will say, Leif, that the yeah. committee has struggled with that du duality as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, we will be interested in answers, uh, however you've decided to respond <laughs> to it. Thank you. Understood. Okay. So the and I I was going to take the the approach I think that the the southeast took, and it's a pretty um, um, direct question and answer from the from the question prompts that were that were raised. So the, the first question was what initiatives, if any, related to new socioeconomic, my emphasis there, data collection had been undertaken within your region. And there are there are none um, specific to equity. And there are also no new data collections that also haven't been fielded before. So the the latest data collections that we are um, administering right now are new iterations, perhaps, but there's of surveys that have already been fielded. So the first of those that seems to have some um, potential relevance to this conversation is called the quota share owner survey. So this is a survey of all quota share owners within the catch share ground fish fishery. And um, relative to some conversations that, and questions that were raised earlier, it does get at inactive in other words, um, quota holders who are not actively fishing their quota, quota owners. And then uh, the other of these two data collections that's just being fielded, I, I believe it went out in June, 
was the West Coast Fisheries Participation Survey. And this is a fishery of, excuse me, a survey of permit holders that asks questions like self-reported incomes, membership and ownership communities, perceptions like impact of fishery management interventions and representation in the fishery management process. And, um, and that one is just being, again, that's been fielded twice in the past and it's just being fielded the third iteration right now. What issues or lessons have we experienced with these current initiatives? Um, so, so one of those, and I'm gonna expand a bit here in the answer beyond just those two data collections that I just referred to, but one of the big ones is that we don't have a sample frame for anything other than from vessel or permit owners on the commercial side. On the recreational side, we have you know, license holders, licensed anglers, um, and also vessel and permit owners on the charter side. <clears throat> but importantly, we're missing groups like uh, vessel crew or processing crew. So we don't have a sample frame with which we can use to, to collect information on those groups. Um, so we're we'd be much more reliant on things like snowball sampling approaches, um, et, et cetera. And for the current data collections, all current data collections, um, the unit of observation is the vessel or the permit owner. So we don't have any information on any new information, relatively new information on crew, um, whether that's on the, the charter side or the, the commercial side. And, and I, th I think that to, to me, at least that precludes somewhat of a more meaningful assessment of the distribution of benefits across demographics. And so for most of our surveys, we just collect very little demographic information. Um, continuing this theme, we don't have, this, this was also a theme that I heard in some other groups' presentations, we don't have dedicated funding for many of these data collections. Um, we do have a, a general pot of funds from that we get from headquarters to do cost earning surveys of either voluntary or, um, or sorry, of the open access survey or the fixed gear survey and on the West Coast. Um, we don't have dedicated funding streams for the charter survey. We don't have any dedicated funding for what we would like to do a crew survey. We do have dedicated funding for the catch share um, cost and earnings survey as well. We refer to that as the economic data collection. Um, but again, for, for most of these, we don't have dedicated funding. One other issue that I, I think should probably be brought up is for the recreational fish surveys that we have conducted, we have not provided any translation. And so we we, we know directly that we're, we're excluding some groups um, right off the bat. And that would be also likely to be an issue on any crew studies that we'd, that we'd want to conduct. Next question was, were there any data collection efforts that have been tried but failed. And I guess the, the direct answer is no, but, and the but is there is some concern that we just would not get approval. I mean, this has been a theme you've heard throughout the day so far, but um, just getting approval through OMB, particularly with related to some of these demographic type add-on questions, um, the feeling is that some of those just won't get approved. Um, in on earlier studies on the recreational anglers, we've also had some pushback on adding more more demographic information onto those. And even um, early on, many years ago, we had some pushback on offering translation, which I thought was puzzling. And then the biggest one here is if if funding and staff constraints qualify as a cause of potential failure, then then we have failed um, because we've been very interested in doing a survey of vessel and processing crew, but we just haven't had the, the funding and staff to, to finish that. The next question was, are there groups of people you think are not being considered, but should be? And the biggest one here is crew members and processing workers. We are very much excluding um, them from consideration here. Also, 
related industry participants. So whether it's vessel repair and maintenance, net and gear suppliers, um, we're just not we're not including them in our in our data collection efforts. We we do so within all of our studies. We we try to break things down by geographic area as small as it's possible to provide information on particular ports and communities that might be um, really dependent on fishing. And uh, although we do try to provide that information, include inclusion can be complicated because of confidentiality reality, confidentiality restrictions. So if we have just a few, like if we have a, one one processor in a port or community then we essentially can't provide information at that level. Um, and, and so that becomes challenging. And then another group that I don't think we are including, but we, we should be our subsistence, subsistence users. And the next question was asking for the, the type of socioeconomic data that the council is currently using in decision-making related to equity. And so this is, Pretty generally, um, revenue data from fish tickets are heavily used. And again, we try to break that up by region, port, gear, and target target species group. Um, you know, as, as long as confidentiality restrictions don't get in the way of providing that information. Uh, cost and earnings surveys, we, we conduct um, cost and earnings surveys of all of the commercial, the federal commercial fisheries. Um, in our region, um, the biggest of those would be the catch share fishery. And so we've referred to that cost and earning survey as the economic data collection. It's a very generic term, but it's very specific. <laughs> it has a very specific definition to us. And then we conduct um, voluntary cost and earning surveys of the open access survey, um, the limited entry fixed gear survey, and also a bit more irregularly the charter owner survey for for the on the recreational side the, <clears throat> the the council also relies on our model economic impacts or contributions from the model known as iopac that our group produces um, the quota share owner survey that i mentioned and historical first fishery participation data have been used to just uh, establish a baseline for dependence. Council also uses perception measures from that participation survey that I that I hinted at. Um, recreational catch and effort are generally used on the rec side. Um, I guess as opposed to more measures like revenues or um, if, if we can measure profits. Um, and those are often aggregated by mode. So to the level of charter versus private versus shore. And, and again, we, we try to break those out by geographic re region if, if possible. The other one, um, we, the other piece of information that the council is currently using here is um, catch share or quota share ownership. Um, and then a little bit of quota share and quota pound trading information. And that's, so far, that's been used to try to establish the, the existing linkages and dependencies among different um, actors in the in this fishery. Are there types of data or analyses related to equity the council is requesting? So, community social vulnerability measures have been requested at the scale of port groups. Um, we do, we don't have that information yet. Um, they have requested information on vessel and processing crew. And the, I guess I'll say here that the council is just beginning to develop an EEJ strategy. And so far they haven't identified specific data needs at this time, um, but likely that will need new information. And one more thing to point out here is that Likely, this will require a more careful analysis of tribal benefits and needs. Um, I, I feel like our data collection and information on that side is, is somewhat lacking. The, the last question here was, are there, are there differences in data information needs for initially setting up a permit or allocation system versus monitoring changes in the fishery over time? And in this one, um, 
I wasn't exactly sure what this meant, but in general, our answer, our group's answer was that permit systems tend to require data at the individual level, um, whereas monitoring, if we're talking about general changes in the fishery over time, is usually conducted at higher levels of aggregation. Um, I'm not exactly certain that's what was being asked for there, so might be a little bit off base, but we can follow up. And then um, I have some source slides here that, that were hidden in presentation modes that I can share that are basically just the sources of all those data, um, the data collections that we conduct at the center. So if anyone has more information, we can I can offer those to dig into more, more carefully. Um, but I did want to bring up one upcoming study that might be of interest. So the Groundfish Catch Share Program, when that was first established, set aside 10% of quota for what was called adaptive management. And so currently how that works is it's just being passed directly to existing quota owners. Um, but one of our economists at the center uh, received some money to conduct a study to examine alternative uses of that 10% quota using more of an equity lens. So what, what could be done with it? Um, and again, I don't have results to share of that study, but it will be kicked off in about two months. So I just thought I would mention that. And that is all that I had prepared. Thank you very much, Leif. Um, I'm going to pause for questions for clarification from the committee. Um, let me just pull my Zoom screen up so I can call on people. Uh, Matt, your hand is up. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on that last point. Um, do you know what alternative uses are being considered for that set aside in the study? Um, it's probably still in the scoping phase of that study. And so I, I think it's a really open question. Um, in particular, if this group has ideas that they would want to share with us um, that would be useful to explore, we would be very open to that. So all ears. Matt, I'm going to ask a question as chair's prerogative. Um, you gave a list of types of socioeconomic data that are used in management. And I wonder whether you could give some examples, perhaps of a few of them, of how those data are used. Are they background information to management or do or are management decisions or alternatives selected among based upon those de de data? That's a great question. Um, as economists supplying the information, we'd like to assume that the information are being used in a way that might affect the actual management options that are chosen. I don't know the extent of, to which that is actually true. I mean, I think that's a, it's somewhat of an open question. We do provide, you know, for example, revenue data, um, um profit type information related to different alternatives that are being being um considered when the council does like the ground fish um specifications process for example um if if the question was the extent to which those data actually influence the options that are chosen i don't i don't actually know that answer um but but we do provide we do provide information um related to the competing alternatives Great, thank you very much, Leif. Uh, Jim, I saw your hand up a little momentarily ago. And it... Well, it was your question, so that was a great question. I thought so as well. Um, but I was actually gonna ask it with uh, specifically to the Fisher Participation Survey, because that seems outside of the traditional way that we would influence decisions with quote allocation. So has that survey itself, how does that feed into the council process? I, I wish I had a more informed answer here, Jim. Um, and that this is why I wish Dan was on the line with me today, um, since that is that's you know his study um, among other collaborators. And I don't know. Um, I guess maybe I'll honestly leave it there. I, I think every any other answer that I would would add on top of it would be too much too too much too much speculation. I think on my behalf. 
I know that it's provided, I guess. I know that it's provided. The council is very aware of it. All the staff, the council are very aware of it. The council economists are aware of this information. Um, I don't know how it's been used to influence any particular management decision, though. Uh, Rashid, you had your hand up. Yeah, so Leif, thank you for the talk. You mentioned that um, <clears throat> many of your service, almost all, please correct me, are voluntary, right? Voluntary service. Is that true? And if that is true, how comprehensive are voluntary service in your view? Yeah, so the only, I'll start with the only exception. The only exception is what we refer to the economic data collection. So the council mandated that all participants in the West Coast ground fish, catch your fishery, have to fill out our economic data collection survey. Um, again, it, this is only the vessel owners and the processors, right? So we don't get into the crew members at all. But but those participants um, have to, by, by regulation, fill out that survey. The rest of those are very much um, voluntary surveys and we've we've generally had decent response rates I mean on the you know 40s and 50s percent um, of, of participants who we try to who we sample um, well on uh, sorry and that's on the commercial side but we, we've also had what I think is this fantastic contractor that we work with and she's extremely personable she she'll, she'll meet with individual participants, take them out for coffee and get the information. And so I think she's got sort of a unique take on what it takes to get people to respond to these types of surveys. And, and she's been fantastic. Um, so I think we owe some of our potential success in the voluntary um, response rates there to her and her approach. Um, but but we're admittedly, we're, we're I mean, with all voluntary surveys that don't achieve 100% response rate, we're, we're certainly missing some folks. Um, and our best way to characterize those is based on, you know, existing information that we have on those potential non-respondents. And those data are pretty limited. I mean, we, we know their vessel size, for example, we might know their revenues. So we can, we might know what other fisheries they participate in. We certainly don't know their demographics um, or anything like that. So. So um, I'm a bit curious, was there any pushback from the quota people who, where you have mandatory data collection? Was there any pushback or they just accepted it? There, I think there was pushback. I, I wish I had a little bit more of a better historical perspective. I wasn't involved in those council discussions um, at the development of the program. It was my like predecessor's predecessor. And so I, I have, I've, I've heard that, yes, there was pushback, but um, it, it was it was recognized that many of the objectives of the catch share program were economic in nature and to be able to characterize those and determine if, you know, the, the program was meeting its aims, then they just they admitted that, yes, they would have to collect economic information um, and, and didn't think that the voluntary approach was going to be um, sufficient. And, and I guess I will say that there's been a little bit of pushback as, you know, we're now more than 10 years into this data collection. And every now and then we do get pushback on, do we still need these information? Do we, do we, still, do we still need this? Um, and in general, participants are still willing to provide us this, this information and, um, and see the benefit in it. In fact, industry participants are the big reason that we actually have that quota share owner survey, they, in, in council discussions, they made it apparent that they thought that some of the, um, we were missing some of the potential benefits and costs associated with the program. And they wanted to be able to characterize the, the quota share owners who were not active fishermen. Rachel, you have the next question. Yeah, um, thanks Leif. Is, I just had a specific question about the historic fishery participation data, is that captured at the community level or um, vessel participation? How's that? We would have vessel level information there. Um, and, and so it's 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 a little bit of both. I mean, I think both have been used. Um, so I guess it depends on the, the question being asked, but, but we do have essentially 
um, a way to track, you know, whether vessels are have been participating in particular fisheries or not throughout the years. And would it be the mailing address or the the home residence? Uh, yes. Um, what is in the permit database? Um, that is a great question. I don't actually, I don't remember. I, I, I don't know that, I know there's some difficulty in assigning a geographic relation of fishing location to those data. Um, so it's, it's probably exactly what you were hinting at with the, the question there. We do know, we, we would be able to know where those, the, the vessel though landed. Um, so we, we would, we do have that information through the PACFIN database. Oh, okay. So it's the port. Yeah. We would have information at least at the landings level of the port. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Um, Lifa, I think those are the questions for clarification. We hope you'll be able to stay on for the panel discussion later on. Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you. I don't yet see Dale. We're communicating with him via email right now. I think we should continue with the agenda okay. um, at this point. All right. Then um, next on our list, a little bit earlier than advertised, uh, is a presentation from the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center, uh, Justin Hospital. Justin? Yes, let me get set up here. Can we see everything okay? Um, on my screen, no. I'm still seeing a black, there we go. Now I see everything in glorious color. Thank you, Justin. All right, aloha everyone. My name is Justin Hospital. I'm a supervisory economist with the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center in Honolulu. I lead our socioeconomics program at PIPS. I've been with the center since 2006. I've led our research program for about eight years now. And I really appreciate the opportunity from the committee to talk with you today about our region and our program. I missed uh, the earlier presentations. I would say mine uh, is a bit more of a narrative approach. So I guess I'll thank you in advance for your patience. So I would like to begin the talk with a few acknowledgements. Firstly, I wanna highlight our PIPS social science research team. These are the stars of the show today. Uh, these are the folks getting the work done, pushing our science forward and advancing new initiatives. It's a really great team to work with. I feel very privileged. I'd also like to acknowledge up front, if the slides will go here. Yeah, so I'd also like to acknowledge up front that we really could not realize any success at all within our region without the support of key regional partners and collaborators. These include our regional fishery managers, Western Pacific Fishery Management Council and the Pacific Islands Regional Office, Cooperative Research Institute, academic partners, uh, local fishery management agencies across the region, community and industry organizations, as well as popular press, social media and radio. Uh, we're really fortunate to work in such a supportive region. So before I get into our program, I do wanna set the stage with some quick regional context. I know you've heard some of this before, so hopefully it's not too much of an overlap, but I wanted to spin the globe a bit, orient us to the world from our perspective. Uh, the Pacific Islands Regional Exclusive Economic Zone is approximately 2.2 million square miles, just about half or just over half of the US domestic EEZ. We currently have four marine national monuments in our region, um, covers about 53% of our regional EEZ. Um, most of this area, but not all, um, prohibits domestic commercial fishing. In total, 49% of our EEZ is closed to commercial fishing. Uh, we have some proposals in the work that would raise this to about 61%. And there's also additional areas outside of the monuments within the EEZ that are prohibit domestic longline fishing. Uh, we're comprised of one state, Hawaii, two territories, American Samoa and Guam, and one Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. We have five Pacific remote island areas, and we share the region with 15 other island nations, Pacific Rim countries. Um, as you all know, this region was settled by voyagers that relied on the ocean 
marine resources for their voyages, in search of new lands for sustaining early island communities, and, and fishing and seafood were and continue to be integral to local community ways of life in our region. Uh, taking a closer look at our communities, um, many islands in our region, about 20 or so, are populated. I've got some population estimates here. Individual islands range from the islands of Ofu and Olusenga in American Samoa. They each have a little bit less than 150 people, ranging upwards to our lovely island of Oahu with over 950,000 people. Um, you know, if we utilize the NOAA Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, we find 14 and 16 percent of communities, and I think this is at the census tract geography in uh, Hawaii and Guam, respectively, are considered underserved, whereas um, over 70 percent of communities in the CNMI and 100 percent of communities in American Samoa are defined as as underserved communities. And I'll note that the the NIMS equity and environmental justice strategy has identified all U.S. territories as priority underserved communities. So unfortunately, we have a relatively high percentage of our communities living below the U.S. poverty line between a quarter and a half in our territories and a disproportionate number of Native Hawaiians at 27 percent in the state of Hawaii. Um, in thinking about regional fisheries, um, in blue font there, Honolulu, uh, the number 10 ranked port in value, fishery value um, for 2021 due to its high quality fresh fish market supplied by our MSC certified tuna and swordfish longline fisheries. And in American Samoa, Pango Pango was number 16 ranked port in landings for 2021, which was down a bit from number seven in 2020. I think it's unique in Pango Pango. It's home to the Starkist tuna cannery the only U.S. tuna cannery operation of about which I think 85% is supplied by U.S. flagged Persane vessels and the MSC certified American Samoa longline fishery. Uh, the cannery is the largest private employer in American Samoa, about 15% of the total labor workforce. It supplies nearly $400 million in canned tuna exports to the mainland U.S. And another interesting benefit of the cannery is that given its scale of operations and monthly uh, energy usage, it's estimated that it effectively subsidizes the utility costs of the island uh, as much as 30%. Um, lastly, in terms of political representation, I just had some notes there. We obviously have um, two representatives in the House uh, for the state of Hawaii and obviously two senators, but just worth noting that within our territory communities, they are each represented by one non-voting delegate in the House of Representatives. Um, across the Pacific Islands region, we live and work in a social, cultural, and economically diverse region. Uh, these colored circles, I'm sorry if they're not great colors, um, but they just represent the breakdowns for ethnicity across our major island areas. Outside of American Samoa, which is predominantly Samoan, most islands have a wide range of diverse languages, culture, traditions, customs, um, it's really an exciting and amazing region to live in and work. Okay, so we're here talking about benefits of fish and fishing. And so um, I just wanted to kind of go through a little bit of that. In Justin, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your yep. sound is coming in and out. I don't know whether you're a little bit further away from the microphone or there's some electronic issues behind it, but if you could if you are a little bit further from the microphone, if you could move closer, we would appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for letting me know early and I will stand closer and talk more deliberate. So uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act recognizes the value, here's, here's a fish and we're, it recognizes the value in terms of revenues or economic contribution or food or recreational experience. However, when we talk to island communities, um, we hear a lot of different values and benefits for this fish. Um, prestige is one that comes up. Maybe this is a big fish, a rare fish, um, a seasonal fish. Um, we hear about tradition and knowledge. Um, you know, we hear about cultural obligations. You know, many, many fishermen provide fish to the village chief or the wider village or community events. Elders in the community, uh, graduations, weddings, um, maybe this was just what was out on the water today. Um, there's likely plans to share this fish with the community, and that speaks to tradition and culture. Um, 
you know, local fresh fish is a, is a healthy source of protein and the social cohesion around all of this supports community well-being. And then in terms of sacrifice, it costs a lot of money, time, and risk of health and safety to go out on the water and come back with fish. Um, we often talk about the uniqueness of our region, but I think these diverse values and benefits um, hold in, in some form everywhere across the, the nation. And benefits and distribution of benefits, we risk vastly underrepresenting them without a proper accounting of all of these diverse benefits. Okay, so that's just a little background. I would like to get into our, our programs. We have three broad flavors of socioeconomic data collections in our region. They are all voluntary. Uh, we conduct structured surveys in the form of continuous cost data collection programs, episodic cost earning surveys. We have non-commercial fishing expenditure surveys, and we do uh, some select knowledge, attitudes, and preference surveys. Uh, we utilize secondary data sources, um, contributing to the NIMPS Community Social Vulnerability Indicators Enterprise. And we employ qualitative approaches such as semi-structured interviews or histories. And then we, we have a, a series of regional fishing directories that we use to better understand our fishing communities, um, try to account for supporting industries and help to ensure our work is representative of those who may benefit from fishing. This is simply an overview of the coverage of our cost data collection programs. The solid uh, darker colors reflect our ongoing trip cost data collection programs. Um, the point here is that I, I think we have relatively good coverage across all of our federally managed fisheries. Um, our continuous trip cost data collections cover fisheries responsible for about 90% of fishery revenues in the region. And our cost earning surveys are every seven years or so, subject to funding, subject to OMB PRA clearance uh, to conduct the surveys. Our cost earning surveys are rather in depth, perhaps more than in other regions. Um, the focus and the primary motivation is clearly on fisheries economics, operating costs, fixed costs, and levels of investment. But we really design these to be integrated socioeconomic data collections that cover operational aspects of the fishery. Um, I mentioned economics, but also touching on some of the social and cultural aspects important for our region, including fisher demographics, what people do with their catch, classification, attitudes and preferences. Uh, we've made efforts to standardize questions over the years across fisheries um, to improve consistency and comparability over time and across the region. We, try to disaggregate our results to the extent that the data allows um, while maintaining confidentiality. Um, common categories that we present data by are by island, by whether an individual sells fish or not, um, various fisher motivations, primary target fishing, boat ownership, um, vessel size, ethnicity, again, wherever we can. And we regularly try to present fisher demographics in the context of the general population with census data where available, just to give a little sense of what our fishing communities look like relative to the general population. Um, so this slide, I just wanted to touch on kind of three critical themes that are really relevant to considering the benefits of, of fisheries in our region, that we regularly collect these data, we document them with our cost earning survey. Uh, for one, it's the idea of fishing motivations. Um, Outside of our regional longline fisheries, the MSA definitions of commercial and recreational fishing are I don't know, problematic at best um, from the perspective of the fishing community and in terms of, of behavior. So this is a recent survey of commercially licensed Hawaii fishers that left far left frame. Um, and this is just their primary motivations for fishing. And we found while they are um, commercially licensed, only about 45% consider some form of commercial fishing, either part-time or full-time, as their primary motivation for fishing. Um, kind of in aggregate, really, these are subsistence fishers, um, fishing for fun with uh, some fish sales to recover uh, the cost of fishing. And then fishermen in our region also have diverse social and cultural obligations for fishing. Here's some results from American Samoa, and we asked fishers what they do with their catch, and we see that you know, upwards of 50 to 60% of catch is, is either consumed at home or given away um, with higher shares in the outer islands of, of Manua. And these findings are pretty consistent across our region. 
Um, the overwhelming majority of fishermen indicate that they feel that they're highly respected by the community um, as someone who fishes. They associate with uh, fishing as an identity and consider fishing a vital aspect of their culture. And again, these findings are very consistent across most fisheries in the region. And then finally, food security is a critical theme, value, and, and benefit for our fishing communities. And this is just a quick snapshot from a survey in the Marianas where upwards of 80% of the fishers consider the fish they catch to be an important source of food for their family across different species groups. And we often will collect data across the region to inquire if there are any species specific level targeting for say home consumption versus sales versus sharing fish. In terms of secondary data uh, to understand community participation, we do participate in the CSBI program, we compile American community survey data and regional fisheries data um, limited to the state of Hawaii due to data constraints. Uh, we have published two regional pieces utilizing this framework, one exploring fishing engagement specific to Hawaii fishing communities. And we sort of took a look at the framework in the context of our region as well. Um, challenges for Hawaii are, are non-commercial fisheries data is rather coarse. We don't have the nice um, geographic scale or even sort of a full accounting of catch as we do with the commercial data. So it's a little difficult to work with existing frameworks. And in taking these applications to the territories, uh, we're in a very data poor environment. We do not have the American Community Survey data. The fisheries data, again, is not really at the geographic um, and species scale that we, can, that we can work with. And also some of the social indicators lack context for the territories. Uh, for one, poverty is, is kind of a difficult measure, um, particularly in some of the outer islands in American Samoa, as uh, census data would highlight very high levels of subsistence activities in these communities. Um, and then lastly, from a methods perspective, I just wanna talk on qualitative methods as these are really a key tool in our region as they offer a flexible data collection approach to support timely and regulatory driven research and really to kind of get at those underrepresented communities. A few select examples I'll briefly talk about. Um, when the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument was designated, there were questions about historical use in the islands unit, which are way up north. Um, so we, don't we didn't have any existing data, so we did some oral history work to support that. And we were able to piece together a really interesting um, picture of past fishing efforts in this area. Um, in 2010, the Hawaii longline fishery had a closure due to international big eye quotas. Um, we hit the docks, hit the markets, and really uncovered that the bulk of the burden from this fishery closure was actually felt by the wholesalers and marketers. Um, the harvesters actually did quite well. And so this was sort of an example of an underrepresented group that we were able to capture through uh, these qualitative approaches. In American Samoa, researchers have documented the dimensions of cultural fishing to support cultural considerations of council actions in response to litigation. Um, we've also done some recent work exploring the role of gender and gender-based social systems in American Samoa. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, researchers, we were able to provide near real-time descriptions and tracking of COVID-19 impacts to many diverse fishery sectors um, utilizing our community connections and qualitative approaches. So these may limit our ability to make broad inferences, but they're often the best or only methodology to reach underrepresented groups. Um, I think, you know, so the work to date, I think we've been very successful in our region. Uh, we obviously need to tackle each effort differently, but I did wanna touch on a few kind of key strategies that we have used in our region. So. Our work relies heavily on strong collaborations with influential members of local fishing communities. Um, you know, I feel like we have a lot of respect in our region, but we also recognize that respect is, is hard to earn and very easily lost. So this really ensures that we stay on our toes and always highly focus to foster and maintain relationships. We pay strong attention to customs, cultural practices, and first languages. Um, our longline fishery trip cost forms are in first languages, uh, Vietnamese, Korean, as well as English. We generally, well, we do provide um, surveys in first languages when we do work in American Samoa, 
surveys in the Marianas are translated into Chamorro and Carolinian. Um, and we often partner with fishing communities in the territories such that local community members um, can coordinate and conduct in-person surveys. And that's attentive to customs, attentive to cultural respect and, and as well as first languages as needed. Um, we promote active two-way information sharing with the community. We regularly produce uh, research brochures, um, put things into popular press literature um, to really make sure that we're closing the loop and that we're collecting information but providing information back to the community. Uh, we actively participate in the council process. Um, all of our staff are involved in some way, shape or form be it the SSC plan teams, social science planning committee, or offering regular presentations to advisory panels, council committees, and fishers forums. And this really helps to maintain relationships and also ensure the community gets timely updates on research efforts. And lastly, we ensure that themes meaningful to the communities. So those ones I touched on earlier, classification, the flow of fish through food and social systems, food security, these are really important to the community. So we make sure we include these in the research design so that we can provide data of interest and uh, support our fishing communities. Of course, we face challenges, um, unique challenges. Every time we do something, there's some new um, opportunity to learn, but communicating research objectives and outcomes to underserved communities across diverse fishing motivations, languages, culture, and customs is challenging. Um, collecting data on socioeconomics, fishing, cultural behavior is inherently sensitive information. So that's just sort of part of doing business. I think in terms of groups that we might miss, um, access to select immigrant populations is probably a notable gap given, given language and community entry barriers. The US Persane fishery is an international managed fishery. Um, I think more work research could be generated to support a better understanding of the economics of this important fishery in our region. Um, additional work with marketers, um, seafood vendors, wholesalers, um, that could provide valuable insights on uh, benefits of fisheries, gender roles, a, a lot. And a tremendous amount of benefits accrue in shore-based near shore and local jurisdictional waters. So sort of outside of the federal realm, but I think some added em emphasis where it makes sense in the future to provide capacity and support. Uh, local fishing agencies in this would, would go a long way to understanding the full benefits of fisheries. Um, implementing surveys is difficult. We don't really have very robust licensing and reporting requirements. I think the state of Hawaii is, is really the only one with any long-term now. Things are evolving in the region and, and moving in the right direction, but really all of the work we do in the territories or non-commercial fishing in Hawaii relies on non-probabilistic sample designs, network sampling. So that sort of adds some uncertainty about the scale of underrepresented groups and participants. Um, you know, we often check our results with the community, but that's it's really all we all we can do. Um, Balancing information needs is important. As you can imagine, our surveys are, are quite long um, and do incur some bur burden, but um, to be able to fully realize a lot of the information relevant to the fisheries, it takes, it takes a lot of effort. Um, I think we've heard in probably enough about Paperwork Reduction Act, but that is an ongoing challenge. Getting surveys approved, um, seems to be a concern, in, at least in the short run. Um, we've made efforts to streamline this. I'm not sure we've been as effective as we'd hoped. Um, and lastly, funding to build capacity. We're really the only shop in town in our region, um, aside from universities uh, doing social science work. Um, it's expensive to do work in our region uh, and somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, The farther away you are, the smaller the community, the more underrepresented you are, but it's inherently more expensive to get there. So the less likely we'll be able to support work to go there. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine a viable solution without more dedicated financial commitment to the region. So just as an example, a one week trip to American Samoa, if we just go to Tutuila, the main island, that's about $4,000. A one week trip to the Marianas, say four nights on Guam, three on, 
on Saipan and the CNMI, that's about $5,500. Two days to a neighbor island in the state of Hawaii is about $1,500. So difficult from a research funding perspective, but I think equally as important from the burden and the constraints on the fishing community. If, if they wanna participate in the council process, it's, it's a little bit challenging from a financial standpoint. Last slide here, I think, on to new initiatives. Um, we have begun to contract social science liaisons with the language and cultural knowledge to reach deeper into fishing communities. We worked with somebody in American Samoa last year. Uh, we're currently working on with someone on Guam and next year is the CNMI. Um, you know, we also have a fisheries management specialist with social science training and, and expertise with a territory focused position description. Uh, we've recently begun to develop economic contribution analyses for the territories. Um, we're trying to model this off the fisheries economics of the United States, which is very um, in-depth, um, limited to states right now, and trying to come up with something comparable to provide valuable information on economic benefits and distribution of benefits across the region. Um, in thinking about council uses, we produce socioeconomic modules for our council safe reports. Um, inclusive of an equity and environmental justice section, which just debuted this year. And these modules really house all of the survey data that we've collected, um, de fisher demographics, island community descriptions, cost of fishing, catch dispositions. It's really a one-stop shop for thinking about um, the benefits and the distribution of benefits for our region. The inaugural EEJ section provides some thematic feedback from some meetings we held in the communities last year. And based on council recommendations, uh, future iterations will likely seek to focus on disproportionate burden and distributional justice issues re uh, relevant to regulations. Um, we've got a new fisher observations process, which was spearheaded by the fishing community. And we kind of work with council staff and advisory panels um, to solicit input from the community, document on the water observations and benefits from fisheries. Um, we, we summarize this work and we publish them as uh, data reports from our science center. And we're also advancing research into looking into frameworks for defining culturally important species. Um, lastly, we do have a Pacific Islands region equity and environmental justice working group that has spun up and is active. They have excellent plans for internal trainings to ensure fishery managers are aware of the contributions that social science can provide in measuring benefits and equity in fisheries management. And as a center, we're working on articulating some plans to enhance community engagement to make sure our work is adequately representative of our island communities. So that's all I have for you today. I appreciate your time. Um, sorry for the sound. I hopefully that cleaned up as we went along. And that's all I have. Thank you. Justin, thanks very much. I, I always love hearing from the Western Pacific. It puts in sharp focus um, some of the re some of the issues that that the agency has to deal with, and the diversity of issues that it has to deal with. Um, I'll open the floor up to questions of clarification from the committee. Um, Jim, your hand was pretty sharp up there. Sure, thanks, Justin. That was great. Let me put my video on. Could you please do me a favor? Could you go back to that uh, diagram that you had that was sort of expanding on thinking about benefits? Let me see. Are we able to, am I still sharing benefits? Yeah, you, you had a nice little flow chart or that had the different characteristics of what fishery benefits are. We're, gonna, we're working our way back. Sorry for these transitions. No, that's fine. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, it was back towards your beginning. And the reason I'm asking is that I, I like that idea of thinking about how to break down and the different dimensions. There it is. Uh, for benefits. What would be great would be is if you had example fisheries for some of these. So like, you know, if you took one of the pelagic longline fisheries, what would be some of the categories that would be highlighted for that particular species? Because Exactly, because, you know, one thing I was thinking of, you know, how much of this is outside of federal fishery management, that these are nearshore reef fish fisheries that maybe hit all the different bubbles, 
but some of the pelagic fisheries, maybe they hit three of the four so, or three of them or something. Um, well, so if, if we wanted to just brainstorm here, if we wanted to talk sure. about the longline fishery, I think um, I think our dollar value would hold. I think food would hold. I think sacrifice, community well-being. I think um, knowledge and tradition. I think um, pretty all-encompassing for a lot of these fisheries. And, and you did touch on that sort of differentiation of near shore reef fisheries, but pelagic fisheries are, are a big deal for everyone across the region. And, and most of them do, you know, those are federal waters, not exclusively given the, the diverse, um, you know, geology of the area and the islands, but, um, you know, tradition, like if we, if we had on that last slide, there was an, an interesting, I hate to be jumping around slides. Um, let me go to the last slide here, but this is an example from our bottom fish fishery in Hawaii of a traditional wedding fish presentation. So that red fish in the middle. So that is, that's very tradition, culture, well-being. That's a, that's a wedding fish and, and that's a, a traditional way of, of preparing that in the state of Hawaii, and there's different variations of that. Um, I mentioned how we try to document sort of are there specific target species. Bottom fish is, is a big one for the island areas, for culture, for sharing, for prestige. But maybe we should put some thought into um, sort of an overview of our various fisheries and, and which of those elements um, speak to them. Thank you. Rashid, you are next. So thank you very much for the talk and uh, uh, a little high level. When you were talking, I kind of, after hearing the other ones uh, earlier, I kind of felt like the Pacific Island Fisheries Management, you guys, you probably are closer to the kind of things we are concerned about here, what you are doing and the kind of values you are taking about around and so on and so forth. So I, I just feel like maybe the committee will, will has a lot to look to, to learn actually from what you have done and how we can incorporate that. So that is one. You, the number of things that I noted, which interests me a lot, you talk about poverty line and no poverty line, above and below poverty line, right? You had figures. So I felt like that could be one of the ways we could uh, cast the distribution of benefit. How much goes to those below poverty line and how much goes to those above. And similarly to income levels also, right? So maybe we can say if you take the population of the fishery, or the, the quartiles, right? How much of the benefit actually goes to the lower 25% and so on and so forth. So things that just, came to mind as you were, you were talking. Finally, on traditional valuation and uh, the, the picture you like, I like it too, right? I mean, and I've been doing, my group, we've been doing something with First Nations and British Columbia. They came to me and my group saying that they, most of the time on the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, that valuation is almost always about the total catch and the money. And they say to them, there are many other values, which is what you, you showed here. So we created a very simple valuation approach that they could use in order to turn all these things into dollar value. So when they go to Ottawa, people will listen to them more because they, so again, this is really interesting and there's a lot we can learn from this, I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Mm -hmm. um, Justin, this is Tom. I have a very simple question for you, and it reflects my lack of knowledge. You talked about the um, qualitative data that you collect through sort of engagement with the community and discussions. When you undertake a qualitative data collection program like that, is it subject to the same constraints that were you to deploy a formal sur survey? So does that have to go through the same OMB pr process or in some senses, are you freer doing that qualitative 
approach than a, a quantitative sur sur survey? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I do think um, the way that I phrased it in the conversation today, it is a more flexible approach, but with that flexibility um, offers limitations. There's only so much you can do. We can't, um, they're generally semi-structured structured open discussions. So conversations can go in various different ways and it requires a lot of effort in going back and doing some grounded qualitative coding to highlight themes but we generally can't make any major inferences about that. It's not in a probabilistic framework. Um, so there are some constraints, but from a flexibility and from a timeliness, it's often um, a very valuable tool for us to, to tackle issues as they arise. Um, I think we're all familiar with the, the scale of fisheries management relative to the scale of research and academics, and those are generally um, quite far apart. Thank you. Um, one more question from Carolyn. Great, thanks. So I'm thinking back to your presentation and you mentioned that there a lot of your social data is featured in the safe documents. So I'm, is that the economic safe or, and I'm just trying to relate this back to MSA and I guess off the top of your head or more than anything, I would, love to have a link to the document or doc or one of the documents that you're thinking about to take a look at how that information is being included. Yeah, excellent. So these, these go into our annual stock assessment and fishery evaluation safe reports for the council. We have a socioeconomic module is what is, is how we, the terminology we use. And it does sort of bridge the economics and the human dimensions aspects. I'd be more than happy to share um, some links with with the committee and, and our council has done some excellent um, efforts to kind of make the documents transition them from 500 page PDFs to interactive uh, data <laughs> portal. So um, I'll be happy to share some links, um, both the big chunky PDF as well as um, the interactive tool for you to look at. And I we would love some input. Justin, thank you very much. Again, I hope you could stay around for the broader question and answer um, that follows. Um, I want to move on to our uh, next presenter in this afternoon, um, representing the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, Brian Garber-Yontz. Brian? Hello. Sorry about that, unmuted right now. Let me get started. So I wanna start uh, by uh, thanking the committee for the invite um, and for having the opportunity to talk about some of the things that we've learned uh, in our experience in Alaska. Um, I do wanna note that that I've had virtually no time to prepare for this. I only learned that I would be participating uh, basically on Friday. Uh, so um, hopes to prepare a presentation over the weekend didn't pan out. So I'm just gonna be uh, making verbal comments. Um, Brian, and I also wanna note that um, that my colleague, uh, Regis and Koyak will be participating in the next uh, set of meetings in August, and she will be talking about sociocultural issues. Um, let me clarify that I'm a, a research economist at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Um, for the last 15 years, I've been running our economic data collection programs, uh, and those are largely what I'm going to talk about today and, and uh, what we've learned through that process uh, since really. 2005, maybe beginning with uh, the crab rationalization program in Alaska. So, within that limited scope of uh, data collection, um, uh, the universe of potential data collections, um, 
I do. I want to start by noting that that um, uh, for Alaska commercial fisheries, um, the amount of administrative data that is produced uh, to monitor uh, uh, catch and landings and processing and revenue and taxation is extremely comprehensive. Um, doesn't cover everything, and notably, it doesn't cover much in the way of demographic information. Um, but it is sufficiently comprehensive that that uh, that the North Pacific Council uh, is is uh, is is quite well resourced to uh, uh, to capture information on. Uh, fishery operations and the distribution and levels of uh, production and, and revenue, both in the harvesting and processing sectors. Um, but digging below the level of, of uh, revenues and production, uh, information is quite limited, um, with a few exceptions, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So. Uh, starting in 2005, uh, uh, the North Pacific Council started a program to collect uh, comprehensive economic data from the crab rationalization fishery uh, or crab rationalization program, um, which was uh, developed as a, uh, an annual uh, economic census, mandatory census applied to uh, catcher vessels, entry processors, and the processing sector. Uh, in 2005, they developed uh, a similar program for uh, the what's called the Amendment 80 sector, which is about 28 catcher processors participating in non-pollock crawl fisheries in the Bering Sea. Uh, in 2012, uh, they developed uh, a data collection for the AFA pollock sector, but it was a sort of a um, a narrowly focused data collection that was really intended to just measure one aspect of um, of a bycatch management uh, amendment uh, within AFA. And then in 2015, they began a, a data collection in the Gulf trawl groundfish fisheries. Um, the council recently completed with the assistance of the Science Center in the region, a uh, fairly comprehensive review of the EDR program. And the documents that came out of that may be useful uh, to the committee if it's something that, that you'd like to look at. Um, a lot of examination of uh, flaws and um, limitations and the reasons for those limitations in uh, uh, in the utility of EDR data and um, and overburdensomeness of some of some aspects of the data collection. Um, apart from the the EDR programs, which are mandatory censuses, uh, we've also uh, undertaken some limited voluntary uh, uh, cost and earnings data collections over the last decade and a half or so. Uh, one of them is um, a chartered business survey that was conducted in 2011 through 2016, which was a very comprehensive employment cost and earnings survey uh, that was administered on a voluntary basis. It was fairly successful. I believe my colleague Dan Liu is, uh, is on the meeting. Um, I'm not sure if I have uh, all of the years that it was collected and uh, but it, it started out close to 50% response rate and then declined fairly pre precipitously in the following years. Um, I believe Dan is developing a new implementation of that survey. Uh, we also in 2015 did a small uh, survey that was really intended to, um, uh, to collect data from, from a small boat fleet uh, particularly the halibut sablefish fishery wasn't limited to that, but um, we had some data available from the other programs, and, and so we focused on filling some data gaps with this survey. And it it was intended to really 
respond to the overburdensomeness of the EDRs and develop what I think was a fairly workable, minimal burden approach to collecting that data. Um, so those are our, our current ongoing data collections. The Goetrol survey was actually discontinued by the council recently. We collected that data for the last time uh, this summer, uh, or rather last year. Um, and uh, they have initiated the development of a new data collection that is intended to address at least one of the aspects of fragmentation that we have in the existing EDR program. Uh, and that is to collect information on crew uh, participation, employment, uh, and earnings comprehensively across all fleets uh, in Alaska. Uh, so that's taking a, a, a different approach than what's done in the past, which is really sort of uh, uh, specific data collections for individual management programs, principally cash share programs. So um, so out of that program review, uh, I think I can draw some uh, some conclusions uh, or draw some attention to key failures in the process over over those years. Um, and actually the, the our data collection efforts really started in 1998 with, uh, a survey that was developed or a set of surveys that were developed um, in collaboration with the, the Pollock uh, fishery, the Pollock industry, that were intended to, that were quite comprehensive surveys, were intended to really um, uh, set a course for comprehensive economic data collection across Alaska fisheries. Um, it was quite a cooperative process developing those surveys, but they were voluntary. And then once they were implemented, um, only one response was received. And that notable failure really kind of set the course for the last 20 years of uh, data collection development and, and how it's functioned. Um, in, in particular, the when the CRAB program uh, started to be developed in the, the, the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the council determined and, and largely through the, the demands of, of our scientific and statistical committee, uh, demanded um, that a mandatory economic census would be part of the management program itself. Um, so that was that was developed in collaboration initially by an interagency working group of economists and social scientists and data experts, and then in collaboration with industry participants, crab industry participants. Uh, and what was developed out of that was an extremely ambitious set of analytical objectives uh, and an intractably complex survey instrument that. Uh, uh, produced both poor data quality because of how complex it was and just vastly overburdensome. Um, the revision process for, for fixing that uh, ended up being quite protracted and quite acrimonious and ended up in the withdrawal of, the, of really council support and reliance on science center and, and agency expertise in developing these kinds of surveys. Um, and that that continued for for quite a long time, uh, and it's really something that only recently is is starting to be um, overcome. Uh, and it it also forestalled sort of nascent efforts that the council was undertaking to develop more comprehensive uh, economic and and other types of, of data collection. Another um, distinct sort of uh, failure within the EDR program, um, a, a particular data collection that has failed, is the Amendment 91 survey, which, which I noted earlier is intended to monitor specific aspects of a part of the AFA management structure. Um, uh, the, since being implemented in, in 2012, the council uh, or the, the data collection itself has never actually achieved the analytical objectives 
and it produces very little data that is of much practical use. Um, but because of just sort of the intransigence of uh, of the institutional process for oversight of these data collections and how difficult it is to implement revisions, um, the council has really uh, declined uh, taking any action to revise the survey, and it continues uh, was not discontinued like the electoral PDR was uh, in the recent review. Um, So that's that's an overview of our EDR program. We have a lot of lessons learned uh, that hopefully will help us to develop the, the crew data collection and build on that to uh, to expand any additional pieces of information, cost and earnings information, uh, potentially uh, quota share, uh, royalty and distribution information. Um, so that's that's we're just beginning development on on that. Um, a lot of the aspects of uh, the shortcomings of the EDR are really have to do with with a sort of evolving set of process failures, um, and these these are things that that we kind of uh, revealed and 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 did a attempted to articulate for the council in the EDR program review. Uh, so the thing, the principal flaw in the EDR program and the data and the utility of the data uh, is fragmentation. Um, data is, is we collect distinct sets of uh, variables in the different data collections. We have those variables for distinct subsets of the uh, fleets and pop and fishery populations. And as a result of that fragmentation, it's really quite difficult to use the data. Um, EDR data uh, lacking cost and earnings data uh, that that is available comprehensively across uh, vessels and management programs uh, in, in council regulatory analyses really limits uh, the analyses that can use that data to those that are really constrained to just affecting that particular subpopulation for which we, we have data. Um, so, and, and those are relatively rare instances. Um, it also really limits the efficiency of the data collection and management process rather than having fairly uniform um, uh, uh, sets of variables and uh, and well-defined populations um, or, or uh, more expanded populations for which we have these data, we end up with, with a, a lot of infrastructure that's built to hold relatively little information. Um, the principal users of our of our data are really council staff and, and regional. Uh, economic staff and regulatory review analyses. Um, and as I've noted, they have relatively few opportunities to use these data in those types of analyses. And consequently, they don't, uh, relatively few staff level analysts have had the opportunity to work with, with these data, develop familiarity with them, understand what they can reveal about um, uh, potential changes in the fishery, potential responses to, to different management alternatives. Um, and also the really the pace of, of workflow for uh, in the council process for, for staff analysts and as well as at the regional office really precludes their 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 ability to to delve into these data and to to um, to employ much more than than simple summaries of data, uh, uh, you know, to employ statistical methods, models to to try and uh, uh, estimate potential outcomes from different management alternatives, um, and consequently, I think the 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 approach has sort of been habituated to doing. Um, uh, to using administrative data where we have full enumeration of 
of certain measurements and uh, and quantitative metrics uh, that can be developed for uh, these analytical documents are really sort of limited to um, to to simple summaries of existing administrative data. And there just hasn't been much development of the ability to use statistical methodology um, to, to capture uh, uncertainty in any kind of formal way. Um, and so that, that capacity really needs to be developed in concert with the data availability. Um, I, I'm sort of talking about in the context of our working relationship with the with the North Pacific Council and flaws in or process flaws that that um, that have become evident. I don't want to put the responsibility for that on the council, I, but it's it's sort of inherent in the structure of council management. So our deference. Uh, or reliance on the council to really sort of take the lead on developing these data collections partly comes out of the fact that um, that we've had fairly poor success with uh, with voluntary data collections. Um, so the need to implement mandatory data collections really necessitates working through a regulatory process. Um, so we're really in the council context for developing those. Um, but the nature of the council's resources um, is such that it's very difficult to develop the sort of continuity of focus and the, and the level of expertise needed to not only know what exactly it is they want to measure, but uh, to develop um, the, the systems needed uh, to manage and collect this type of data and to, to design efficient survey instruments. Um, so that, that ex expertise is largely lacking. Um, and I think that's the result of the, the lack within our agency of a community of practice that has, uh, been developed or, or hasn't been developed. And it's largely because of resources constraints that other people have talked about already today. So the, the fact that we're, we're a small, um, a uh, group of scientists and, and other personnel working on this kind of information, both working on the sort of social science of the work, but also working on the, the survey science aspect of data collection, uh, which is a whole uh, area of expertise that uh, generally, generally folks going into to fisheries, uh, social science and economics are not generally uh, trained in survey science, or if they are, it tends to be, for economists at least, tends to be non-market economics, uh, which is uh, household surveys. And an important lesson that we learned fairly early on uh, is that business surveys are very different from household surveys. Um, when you're trying to collect uh, cost and earnings, essentially financial data from complex businesses, uh, it's a very demanding survey design context and uh, requires a very different approach from designing a household survey or even a business survey for small owner operator types of businesses. Um, and that, so that community of practice uh, that would help us to develop that expertise as an institution, I think is largely lacking. And that's another aspect of fragmentation. So we have you know, individual um, science center staff working on individual surveys, um, but we rarely have the opportunity to sort of come together and compare our approaches and develop a set of uh, best practices. That's something that's that's been addressed in, in by uh, Office of Science and Technology. Recently, we had a couple of working groups that have been productive, one on vessel returns and one on cost and earnings data harmonization. But these are recent efforts um, and, uh, and fairly limited in scope.
And that's you know, something that I think is important to, to draw the comparison to is the, the community of practice that exists um, within the stock assessment realm of science and uh, and all of the uh, institutional and intellectual resources that are devoted to uh, to national standard one and maximum sustainable yield and harvest specifications, um, which is a very clearly delineated set of uh, requirements under national standard one, uh, which in contrast to the scope of uh, sort of analytical mandates that we have with respect to economic and communities, uh, economic uh, outcomes and distribution and community effects and other socioeconomic aspects and sociocultural aspects. Um, uh, somehow, I think we need to develop a community or communities of practice to be able to tackle those issues, and it's going to take time. Uh, so getting to, to other lessons learned other than those observations about process failures, um, uh, things that we've learned in the, in the course of, of uh, implementing our economic data report program and reviewing it and, and trying to improve it over time is really the need for less rigid forms to develop these surveys. And uh, as people have noted, Resource limitation, limitations and PRA constraints really limits our ability to, to undertake experimentation. And so we have really just a, a small handful really across the agency of cost and earnings surveys, let alone the full scope of, of survey uh, uh, data needs and, and, and survey applications that, that are badly wanting. Um, and the, the need to, to experiment is really precluded by the rigidity of the, the system that we work in. Um, one small aspect of that is the fact that pretesting is critical and it's really difficult to accomplish. Uh, in particular, with business surveys, some of these surveys are quite complex. They take uh, they may take a, a submitter 20 hours to complete and getting somebody to pretest a survey that takes 20 hours, um, that's not something that most people are going to do voluntarily. And if they are, they're not representative of the general population that you're attempting to collect data um, from. They're, they're going to be more sophisticated and more, um, more motivated to, to be engaged rather than than you know, most operators who uh, are resistant to reporting data and may not have particular accounting sophistication. Um, business surveys are very different. I already noted that. Uh, burden is very complex and it's not simply a matter of cost and time. Um, uh, the sensitivity of individual pieces of information and the perceived risk of reporting that information. Um, and in our case, uh, we actually have a signing statement in, it, in our EDRs that uses the term perjury. Uh, so that just the, the, the risk that at least some submitters um, feel that they're exposed to in reporting information is, is unnecessarily heightened. Um, you know, how am I doing for time? I think, um, Brian, if you're able to wrap up shortly so we can take a few questions, that would probably be um, ideal. Sure. So um, we'll just ask you to wrap up soon. We are still um, working with Dale to get him on the line, uh, so we should have him momentarily. Okay. All right. Um, uh, other lessons learned. Uh, data quality is really hard uh, to convey to non-scientific, non-statistical uh, uh, audiences. Uh, and not only that, but it's 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 just a difficult uh, concept to get heads wrapped around in a sort of general context, um, as opposed to data quality when you're talking about for a particular application or a particular set of variables. Um, but in these data collection programs that are intended to be sort of multifaceted and multi-use, uh, 
uh, it's it's hard to capture data quality. Um, so that's a, an area of uh, capacity and expertise that I think we need some development on within the agency. Um, as far as as uh, people in groups not considered, there there are large areas of social cultural um, populations that uh, that I'm not even going to try to address um, within the the strictly economic realm and particularly within industrialized commercial uh, fisheries. Um, a key population that we don't have much information on that has asked that has direct application to distributional as, uh, uh, equity is information on the flow of quota royalties, uh, quota uh, quota earnings uh, to quota holders, uh, because um, most of the information that we that we collect on revenue is really at the sort of entity level, um, whether it's a vessel owner or a, or a quota shareholder or a permit holder, um, those holders tend to be entities rather than individual persons, um, in many cases at least. Um, the largest beneficiaries tend to be entities. Um, uh, so we, we don't have a lot of information uh, that we can link to individual persons and therefore, even lacking demographic information, we really don't have the types of entities that have demographics, um, in, in a sense, anyway. Um, the council is prioritizing crew as sort of the first uh, highest priority of an uh, uncovered population uh, that we want to monitor um, uh, as, um, as uh, beneficiaries of uh, fisheries management and with direct and solid linkages to uh, to communities. Um, so that is the first priority, and that's uh, the next initiative that we will be pursuing. Um, and I'll stop talking. Now. Thank you, Brian. Um, reserve time for questions of clarification from Brian. Jim. Thanks, Brian, especially for doing this on uh, such short notice. You mentioned uh, the council efforts with regards to crew participation and earnings. Could you elaborate a little bit more on where that is and the timing and what the, the scope of it is? Sure. So something that sort of distinguishes Alaska is that uh, commercial fisheries crew are required to hold a license issued by the Alaska, uh, state of Alaska, um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Those licenses, the commercial crew licenses, are, are, are basically similar to, to hunting permits. Um, they're part of the same sort of permitting process as uh, hunting and fishing permits. Um, there's a fair amount of, of uh, well, residency, address, age, sex. Um, that is the set of demographics that are collected in those uh, in those permit applications. Um, uh, but that's that's really sort of the richest uh, demographic information that we have for any you know class of participating. Um, um, set of individuals in, in commercial fisheries. Um, so those licenses, um, the issuance of those licenses generates a registry um, in our EDRs, there are at least two of them, the CRAB EDR and, well, CRAB EDR, the Amendment 80 EDR and the Gulf Trawl EDR, all collected crew license numbers and crew earnings and participation. So the number of crew members in particular classes are reported in those EDRs. Um, total uh, crew earnings or, or uh, uh, crew payments by category of, of crew to, in certain instances, those are, that's um, stratified by individual fishery. Um, so we have all, we basically have most of that information or, or have those sets of variables collected for, for our EDRs. 
uh, what the council is has uh, and and those but those EDRs also collect other sets of variables so you know limited sets of costs and variables um, uh, or in some cases very liberal very limited in the amendment 80 context quite comprehensive reporting of of capital and its and annual expenses for fishery uh, for for vessel operations um, so the council just took action in, uh, in I guess June, uh, recommending the development of the crew uh, uh, universal crew data collection program, uh, and we at the science center uh, are uh, hope, will hopefully be coordinating with the uh, Alaska Regional Office to. Uh, to develop this data collection, but there's a lot of different ways it could go. Um, the council was uh, fortunately not too prescriptive on how we go about to uh, actually collecting this data, and it's something that we could maybe break up into different components and collect different aspects of um, of the data stream at uh, different platforms that are more advantageous. So in-stream collection of, of crew participation information is uh, one example and an annual summary of, of earnings. Was that too long-winded, Jim? No, that was great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you, Brian. Uh, I see that Dale has joined. So to paraphrase the first, she'll become last. And um, we're going to, Dale, if you would like to just do a sound check, just to make sure we can hear you. Yeah, hello. Yep, hey. great, we can. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, Dale. Uh, as, as a reminder, Dale is the program lead for the Southwest Fisheries Science, Economics and Social Science branch. and. Um, Dale, thank you very much for joining us. Very good, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna present, of course, from the Southwest Center. Uh, just let me do a little minimization here. So, um, so this will represent, I'm gonna start off, I'll talk about uh, international tunas through the Air, uh, Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission. And then I'll talk about our small pelagic uh, fishery uh, where we have some information. Um, <clears throat> So the uh, international tunas, uh, that uh, involves with a transferable uh, effort credit scheme we are developing uh, jointly with the uh, Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission for tropical tuna purse seiners in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Uh, the U.S., of course, is a state's party to the convention, and it's working through the IATTC Capacity Working Group and uh, is done, the scheme is done jointly with the uh, Secretariat. Um, and we are using principles of uh, fair division uh, to design an allocation scheme of days. And we will soon be using principles of fair division, notably a claims problem, uh, to look at uh, new, uh, uh, granting new entrants. Uh, uh, eligibility and, and assessing and taxing um, uh, days at sea to uh, these new entrants. And uh, now, so we look at a quality of outcome and on the allocation scheme, we have distributed shares of days. Uh, the scheme is, is really not too different than the uh, vessel day scheme of the parties to the narrow convention. Um, and then, um, we are also looking at, uh, for the new entrance problem as a claims problem, um, we're looking at the impact on vessel, uh, basically on efficiency as measured by uh, vessel daily operating profit from different types of ass uh, assessment schemes, um, constrained equal losses, uh, proportionality of the two uh, major um, uh, approaches. Uh, so with that, the kind of data that's required are landings from the uh, IATTC data, uh, prices from Manta, Ecuador. Um, yeah, we supplement a bit with uh, Bangkok prices if, if required. Uh, operating costs for uh, different flag states, vessel size classes, uh, whether they fish with a dolphin mortality limit or not. Um, 
And these come from a series of uh, surveys and then companies will provide confidential information. Um, we will look at vessel sizes. Uh, they measure that in cubic meters of well capacity. Uh, the various flag states that have a tropical tuna per saner that um, is eligible through uh, resolution C203. Um, they have basically a limited entry program there. And then whether they have a dolphin uh, mortality limit or not. And that data comes uh, from the IETTC, ISS quality of outcome using standard kind of uh, equity uh, metrics. And the uh, new entrance problem uh, is a bit of a work in progress. We're having a workshop uh, late August, uh, early September to work that out. I've done a lot of preliminary investigation um, uh, on that where I look at the impact, basically on Pareto efficiency. Okay, and then we have the coastal commercial coastal pelagic CPS. Uh, <clears throat> so we have transition CPS costs and earnings survey from using a single fishery specific survey to a regional, uh, a general regional multi fishery survey. Uh, it's a collaborative effort to integrate the CPS cost and earnings survey with the Northwest Fishery Science Center ground fish open access survey. Uh, the bundled ICR, uh, which OMB approved April 27th for 16 groups of commercial fisheries, uh, allows us to use the voluntary costs and earnings surveys included in that ICR through April 30th, 2025. Uh, there's no funding currently available for implementation. Now on recreational fisheries, um, there is a discussion on moving to a national recreational business cost and earnings survey uh, from the current regional specific survey. Um, and there's a hybrid generic ICR survey currently under review at OMB uh, since uh, 2022. Um, so now in uh, what issues or lessons uh, have been learned? Uh, so there's the issue of survey OMB clearance. Survey clearance times are longer than anticipated. Are there socioeconomic data collection efforts that have been tried and failed? Um, the 2021 fielding of the CPS cost and earnings survey had a lower than expected response rate, about 15%, and response rate fell from prior uh, uh, survey effort levels. Now, I wanna say parenthetically, we don't have any cost share programs out of La Jolla. In as a quant consequence, we really don't have any leverage for sort of man mandated uh, cost and earnings uh, data uh, collection. Um, are there groups of people that you think are not being considered in current efforts but should be? Uh, the demographic data is not uniformly collected across commercial or recreational surveys. Um, are there types of socioeconomic data related to equity that the council is using or relying on in decision making? No, the CPS management is primarily based upon biomass estimates. Um, thanks. Now, I, I want to add also uh, parenthetically that <clears throat> um, we don't have a social scientist uh, in the Southwest Center. Uh, we are short an FTE, and that's been frozen for quite a while. Uh, and we are also short a um, base, uh, F, a base uh, FTE as well. Um, so, and we, so as a consequence, we don't really collect that sort of demographic information that's used by the social scientists uh, and would uh, pertain to environmental justice issues. So I'm uh, happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dale. I'll um, open it up for questions of clarification from the committee. Rashid? Yeah, Dale, how are you doing? Good, man. I'll see you in a couple of weeks here. Yeah, yeah. So it seems you, you, you people have been able to collect some demographic data. Is that true? And how come, because we heard from other groups and that is a difficult thing to collect. Uh, we have not. Um, no. uh, here in La Jolla uh, in particular, it's really us, um, it's really we three economists 
uh, with Sam Herrick's retirement, uh, we're short an economist there, and we're supposed to have an FTE, and that's been frozen uh, from Washington. That's been frozen for quite a while. Uh, we don't have, whether here or in Santa Cruz, a uh, social scientist that would normally concentrate on demographic data. Uh, we could, if we were looking at things like equality of opportunity, uh, where we were trying to uh, get uh, sort of uh, equality of opportunity adjusted uh, incomes or, or uh, shares or whatever, but uh, we haven't applied any of that, um, uh, those sorts of ideas to uh, here in the Southwest Center, particularly La Jolla. So, so uh, quick one. So the limitation there is uh, capacity, is, is people to actually do it, not because of any other barriers? So. Yes, uh, we, we literally are short two people, okay? And okay. Um, one is a full-time, that's when Sam Herrick retired, and yeah. he's not been replaced. And there is an FTE on that line out of DC that everybody has. Uh, we were getting ready to hire somebody in 2008, uh, and then that was, uh, with the crash, uh, that was um, stopped, and there's been no discussion of uh, filling that uh, that Washington S and T based FTE. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Well, that's what I like. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you one more if there's none. <laughs> yeah, you talk about equality of outcome. Can you explain that, please? And um, it sounds interesting, so. Oh, well, I, um, you know, there's kind of two broad, in distributive, the philosophy of distributive justice, um, mm. you, there's a distinction between, really dating from John Rawls and uh, Ronald Dwork, and then later supplemented with Richard Atchison, who's here at UCSD, a guy named Cohen, who was at Oxford, and then the economists we might know of John Romer and Mark Fleurbay picking up on it. So there's a distinction between equality of outcome, which is pure consequentialism, which is just what you would think of. And there, you can apply the standard kind of metrics. You could, you know, Penn's parade, you could do Lorentz curve, Gini coefficient, Atkinson's uh, equity metrics, or the generalized entropy tile methods would be kind of standard uh, assessments. And then now equality of opportunity says that, well, let that, you know, people have outcomes due to kind of two broad issues. Uh, one is exogenous circumstances beyond their control, responsibility, or choice. Mm -hmm. And that might be, that would fit in with uh, uh, environmental justice issues. Uh, so that would be like uh, income, gender, race, uh, maybe you're born in a poor community. Um, it's kind of known in the egalitarian opportunism literature as just sort of uh, birth bad luck. And then, um, the other variable would be, you know, effort, I meaning how much do you, some people, you can put them in equal circumstances, and some care, and some don't, you know, some will be, you know, rich, some won't, whatever. So the equality of opportunity, what one does is one, um, you can regress and you can say, let's take, I, I'm doing this with the International Seabed Authority, regressing, mm -hmm. um, the gross national income per capita upon various exogenous variables that would represent these circumstances beyond control. And then you get an income that's left over. You can apply something like a tile uh, or generalized entropy uh, uh, between index. And then what you get is you get different equity measures for the different groups where you've controlled for these circumstances. You're, you're looking at differences between circumstances. And then you can you can actually go a step further and devise things like distribution weights based on that. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that's equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody in fisheries has yet, uh, oh, well, other than me, has applied quality of opportunity to uh, look at fisheries. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> uh, that's good. <laughs> it's really interesting stuff, let me tell you. Uh, Rachel, you're next. Yeah, thanks. You you also mentioned the new entrance problem, and did you did you have data to support the new entrance problem, or how was that showing up and driving the the 
policy work you're involved in? Yeah, so we've designed a transferable day credit scheme, not a rights-based management, but a credit-based system. And uh, more like what you see in pollution, or in this case, there's a precedent here in dolphin mortality limits. So these are simply um, limits uh, made flexible within a year. So we have this transferable scheme. And so I, count, I have a simple model. And what I've done is I've calculated um, the increase in efficiency that can be expected. And, um, and there is an existing limited entry program here. And then we allowed for, um, then I allowed for new entrants to come in. Now the new entrants have something called capacity, which is it's how it's like a limited entry program with a vessel length. In this case, is cubic meters of well capacity. So you, um, I designed a couple of different allocation schemes to uh, for the new entrants. Flag states that receive capacity, the right to capacity, that is new entry, and how much, how many boats they, how many cubic meters of well capacity they would receive. Uh, based upon the existing precedent of the fleet, the existing fleet. And then I, and then you have to operationalize that. One has to give days. Now, if you did a transferable day credit scheme, you would have a total allowable effort. So that means you have to take some of the existing days, and we measure it by days at sea because it's easy to measure, and allocate it to these new vessels. So then the, the question becomes, because in a, in a voluntary self-enforcing organization, such as a, uh, a regional fisheries management organization, you know, the votes are uh, invariably by consensus or unanimous. And so if the Pareto principle or acceptability doesn't hold, that is that a state's party might actually lose uh, welfare, in this case measured by uh, vessel uh, operating profit, uh, then they might actually not agree to whatever you want to do. So um, I've been operating under that limit. And then, so I, there was a count, there was an increase. I calculated a vessel specific uh, increase in uh, vessel daily operating profit. So there was a Pareto increase, but not, not by all vessels. And, and that's the rub. So I calculated if you took the aggregate increase in efficiency, there is enough profitability to cover the new entrants and giving them the basically the mean um, uh, daily uh, uh, days uh, corresponding to boats of their size. But when you realize that about a quarter of the boats don't increase their efficiency, that means that we were to tax them any, any days they would um, go negative in profit. And so the incentive for their uh, corresponding flag state might be to uh, veto this. Now, the problem we face is that many boats are multi-vessels. So it's quite possible they might reallocate internally, but I can't measure that. So then I tried, now, and then I tried, so Aristotle's equity principle or strict proportionality does not work then because you're taxing everybody. But I tried looking at another um, fair division principle called constrained equal awards, uh, losses, which is where you uh, give e you tax everybody equally on the existing boats on days, but if they lose profits, uh, they're not taxed. But and if I were to apply that uh, uh, bankruptcy rule, uh, it would work. But the problem is, I'm relying on a couple of things. Um, strategy proofness by which because we have multi-vessel companies and even flag different you know within a flag state you have these different vessels so if if i, I don't mean a uh, strategy proofness i mean incentive compatibility so that they might change the ownership of the boats and or they might transfer shares to one another and only the uh, proportionality principle is incentive compatible so then you're left and the other problem we have is that I can't, you know, these these measures of profit are not verifiable and it's not strategy proof. I can't rely on these guys to honestly report this. So I'm really stuck. Um, I'm stuck by the Pareto principle and I'm stuck by incentive compatibility and I'm stuck by strategy proofness. In aggregate, we can do it, but I don't know of a rule, a fair distribution rule 
that would allow this um, assessment and satisfy the Pareto principle or acceptability, uh, incentive compatibility and strategy proofness. So uh, I'm bringing in some fair division people uh, for a workshop here in La Jolla uh, and um, see if they have any ideas uh, about how to get around this problem. Um, is the problem, of course, again, is that you have, uh, and these are voluntary self-enforcing organizations where decisions are made by consensus. So all you need is one state's party to lose and have an incentive to negate everything. Now, the beauty of such an approach is because it's a fair bargain, it's a, you get both fairness is non-envy and impartiality. And then it also leads to a concept of justice as impartiality following Brian Berry. So that's great. When you get a decision, it's, we can legitimately say it's a fair, it's, it's a fair decision, all right? Satisfies a fairness, a couple different fairness definitions. But we got this problem that of uh, incentive compatibility, uh, strategy proofness, and I can't, I can't measure profits. Um, I, you know, what actual profits are, they're just off some dumb model. All right, long-winded answer, but it's kind of, a, you know, a reasonably complex problem. All right, thank you very much. Um, we've been going at this for two hours now. I would propose a sort of seventh inning stretch for 10 minutes uh, to allow people to uh, stretch their legs, take a personal break if you need to, coffee break if you need to. It's 3.03 .03 on my watch, three minutes past the hour. We'll come back at uh, 13 minutes past the hour for a panel discussion. So thank you all very much. I, we hope those uh, who are on the Zoom call can come back with us um, for the panel discussion. We do understand if you have to drop off, if you have other commitments. Um, but thank you to all our presenters, and we'll see you again in 10 minutes. Uh, socioeconomic of collecting socioeconomic data um, to help the agency assess the equity in the dis distribution of fishery management benefits. Um, we had follow-up questions for clarification uh, after each presentation. I'd like now like to open the floor um, to more general questions from the committee. Uh, if uh, People in the audience wish to comment on the questions. We ask that you please use the raise hands feature, which is under the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, um, possibly under the more button, the three ellipses. Um, uh, if you don't have a reactions button. Um, but I'll, I'll perhaps start with a broad question. Um, and it, it's something that is at least forming in my mind. Um, and I came into the committee process thinking that the answer that the answer to the question we had been asked was before before us if we only dug a little to find the answer. And I'm beginning to wonder whether the the equity discussion in fisheries isn't uh, in a sense, uh, a technology forcing question that we don't have the tools in our hands currently to answer the question. And, and the very fact that we're asking the question is going to force us to develop new ways of collecting data, new ways of assembling data from different sources, new ways potentially of analyzing date, data from different er areas. So for those of you in the regions, do, do you think each of your regions is equipped to answer the question about the, the degree to which benefits of fishery management are equitably distributed? Or do you feel that you are challenged by that question that, that those data are not at hand and in fact would require new data collection systems to begin to answer them?
As usual with my questions, there's a stunning silence in the answer. Um, Brian, thank you very much for taking up the gauntlet. Brian and then Leif. Brian? Sure. Um, well, I mean, you know, clearly how to measure equitable distribution is is a uh, complicated questions and and uh so it's hard to hard to answer the question of can we answer that question without really understanding uh uh exactly how to do it. Um, but I think you know it, that caveat not, notwithstanding, we, we clearly don't have sufficient data in Alaska to do it. We can we can understand a certain extent the distribution of uh of say ex vessel revenues amongst vessels, but tracking the the, those benefits through vessels down to the community level is hampered by the lack of of uh, ownership information or or uh, uh, at least tractable ownership information uh, for for vessels um, uh, really complicates that. So it, it's hard to even uh, uh, imagine uh, any particular aspect of, uh, equity and distribution that, that we could adequately respond to given the available data. Great. Thank you, Brian. I, I suppose I'm heartened by the fact that you think even ex vessel value is something that could be done currently. Uh, Leif. Um, after Brian's response there, I am, I'm not sure I actually have a different perspective and much, much difference to add. Um, I mean, I, I do think that there are some cases where some version of equity we we could come up with some sort of measure i, I think that's extremely limited and we we don't have that on anything more than a, a vessel level or um a, you know anything like that so at the individual level absolutely not from a demographic perspective across de different demographics no we don't have sufficient information so unfortunately no thank you leaf and um, dale you were the third who 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 took the bait. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, everything that's been said, I, I agree with. Uh, I mean, most fundamentally, what do you mean by equity and for whom? Those are the questions. And only when you really address what do you mean by equity and for whom can you can we really answer the data question. So I think given the fact that we have landings and we can usually get price information, we, we can look at, there are a lot of standard equity metrics for uh, looking at, at that. And then with some pretty standard definitions of equity, although you have to get some ethical decisions about which uh, part of the income distribution you're going to weight. And then if, if you're going to look at in terms of profits, uh, well, our cost out is kind of iffy. If you're going to look at uh, demographic information to get at things like the quality of opportunity versus a quality of outcome. And we're mostly talking about a quality of outcome. Then we need really good demographic data. And if you mean communities, then again, we're short of data. So it in part depends upon what you mean by equity and for whom. And I can, I think we can answer some rudimentary questions, uh, but ba mostly based on landings data. Uh, anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you, Dale. I'll give Justin a uh, chance as well, and then we'll go to uh, Rashid and, Rachel. So, Justin. Yeah, thanks. I'll just I'll just chime in that, you know, in our region, we haven't really applied any equity measures aside from maybe looking at the distribution of revenues in select um, select fisheries. So there's a lot of room to be to be made there. And I think going back to my talk and, and the diverse benefits in our region, I think we have a lot of work we need to do first to understand frameworks to measure these benefits. Um, Rashi had great observation that there's advances in methodologies to quantify a lot of these non-market benefits. But I think an inherent problem in our region is that a lot of the communities would have problems with assigning dollars and monetary values to a lot of these benefits um, and almost goes against the point of those benefits to certain certain communities. So I think that's my brief comment. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Rashid, I think you are next. Yeah. So Justin, yeah, your, your last point there is well taken. I mean, 
the first time I, I went to Prince Rupert and tried to talk about value in their fishery, you should have been there to see the reaction. It was unbelievable. I had to stop talking about value in First Nations fisheries for years until somehow they came back to me. So I think there's movement that there's now more indigenous people in Canada who say, look, for our values to be taken seriously, we have to just buy the bullet and, and put some dollar values. But others are still arguing in the sense you, 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 you just uh, explained. That's the first point. In general, about data, you know, <clears throat> and this is coming from a university person, so maybe it doesn't work for you who are actually doing work on the ground, real work, right? But in general, in my lab, we never accept, I never accept the student coming to me and say, I can't do this study because I don't have data. No, no, there is data. It's not perfect. And some data are better than others. But in general, all data are, are what? Living data. They are data in progress. If you think of life, there's no point in time that you have all the data on anything. And we can argue about that. Do you know what particles are floating here fully? I don't think so. Tomorrow, a scientist may get an equipment that will tell us more. So essentially, what we do is take whatever data you have, do the best you can, and make the decisions you have to make because you cannot just go to sleep and give up, right? So, so that is how I will approach this. No matter what you can do, you start the progress. And actually, by starting, you improve the data. And it goes on. And before you know, you have the data you, you really need to do a complete analysis. So I just want to encourage that. The idea that we have no data, we can't do anything. We should just abandon that and do the best we can. Let's get going. Anyway. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, I think, I think it was Justin who mentioned a tool um, that I, I don't know if we'd heard of yet. So I wanted to ask the full group about this um, climate and economic justice screening tool. And if they've found that useful in this, in this realm, it looks like they're presenting data um, at the census track level, but also in the context of federally recognized tribes. And it seems like there might be some opportunity to at least understand or, or consider equity and at those scales in the context of fisheries. So mm -hmm. is that something that your science centers are working on or working with, or are there, are there issues with that? Danica, in response to Rachel's question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello, uh, Danica Kleiber again. Um, oh, let me try and Hi. Um, so in terms of that tool, I think one of the issues that, that Justin mentioned, again, coming from the perspective of the Pacific Island region, is that the data, census tract data, is not available in the territories um, on a yearly basis. And so we get uh, sort of uh, data poverty issues. And so they kind of get left out of some of these considerations. So you get potentially some of the most um, un underserved communities just being left out of the equation altogether when we look at it at that national scale. So that that would be um, that that has been my persistent concern with that data. It's also at a at a geographic community scale, so um, you can understand something about the general demographic uh, attributes of those communities, but connecting that to who's doing the fishing, who's benefiting from the fishing, who's marketing the fishing, that's much harder to do. And so that, that connection, as, as was mentioned earlier, is, is the difficulty. But yeah, that's just from my experience. Yeah. Thank you, Danica. Um, I see that Minyang is still on the Zoom call, and so I'll just invite Minyang if you want to offer answers to any of these questions um, from your Northeast perspective, you're please welcome to, don't feel constrained uh, uh, about responding. Um, Grant, you're next on the list. Yeah, thanks. I have a, a broad question uh, that may be difficult, but I appreciate any responses. 
in the definition of equity in the recent uh, strategy document, the uh, fisheries equity and environmental justice document that came out, um, the term underserved communities is used a lot, but the actual definition of that as provided in that document is really quite broad. Mm. There's reference to ethnic and racial categories, to religion, to gender, to sexual orientation, to poverty and um, economic condition, to persons with disabilities, to people living in rural and urban areas. Mm. Uh, and that could be read as extremely broad and including uh, quite a few groups. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's any clarity within the organization or within your groups about priority or tractability or perhaps both with that list of, of attributes and membership in underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, sorry, don't mean to be hogging the, <laughs> the time. So um, I'm a social scientist at the Pacific Island Fishery Science Center. I was also one of the co-chairs of the group, of the working group that created the strategy. Um, so I was, I've been intimately involved <laughs> in the definition. So we went, um, the, those, all those categories were a result of going off of the definition from 13985, the executive orders coming out of the Biden administration. Um, but as you, as you can tell, we also looked specifically for fisheries, uh, underserved communities within the fisheries context. So that's where you get a lot of the language on crew, um, processing plant workers, subsistence fisheries, et cetera. Um, so I think the way it's structured is, is every region and program office is, is supposed to really look for uh, their their own. We didn't want to be prescriptive. Um, obviously, it'll be different from region to region. So that in, that question might be answered more specifically in, in the implementation plans, which should be coming out uh, towards the end of this year. Thank you, Danica. Um, Lisa. Yeah, I think I'm going to articulate this really badly, but um, Justin and others in the Pacific, um, I, it got me thinking a little bit about the relationship between the federally managed species in U.S. waters and the, the larger, really big value fisheries in the region like the tuna fishery, um, some of which is managed, uh, you know, through international agreements. And what struck me was some of the data on like the importance of the port and the value of the landings, um, you know, side by side with high levels of underserved communities and high levels of um, poverty as defined by those metrics. And I guess my question is just how you in the region think about fisheries allocation between sort of the federal level and these really high value international fleets. Um, if you're allowed to think about them, if it's part of your mandate, or if it's just, you know, something that you have to set aside. Hmm. Justin? I guess I'll, I'll speak to this briefly since since our region was member mentioned and we, we have tuna fisheries. And so I, I would say in Lisa's question, we typically focus on, um, you know, measuring the economic performance and benefits of our fisheries. I know our council is probably a little bit more equipped towards uh, advocating on behalf of the domestic fleet in the international arena. We haven't done a lot of work. Um, I know Dale has done a lot more work than we have in our region in the context of international tuna fisheries, but um, at the Science Center, we're, we largely focus on our regional longline fisheries, documenting the benefits, economic performance, and, and the council is usually utilizing our information to advocate on behalf of domestic fisheries. And the State Department is, is the one at the table, as far as I know, so mm. we're a little bit removed from that. Mm. Thank you, Justin. Other questions from the committee? Rashid? Yeah, for Alaska. I was wondering uh, the, the systems you described, to what extent the community-based 
fisheries quota is taken into account. The one connected to Alaska uh, indigenous people. Um, thank you for the question. Um, it kind of to consider how to approach that. So, um, uh, the community development, well, the, the, um, community development quota groups, um, they are, I mean, their their ownership of uh, of quota is is clearly identified. So we know um, we know we uh, uh, we we know certain things about their 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 exercise of those benefits and harvests uh, that quota. Um, in the crab program, we do monitor uh, royalty payments for uh, or, or costs at the vessel level um, that are being paid just for CDQ uh, crab quota. Um, we uh, we do know uh, CDQ group ownership of non CDQ crab quota, um, so we can look at the distribution of ownership within the the. Um, crab quota pools um, by uh, uh, CDQ group uh, equity. Um, are, are there particular aspects of CDQ group engagement that that you had in mind? So, so if we take if you take let's say um, I don't I don't know the details so. Let's say you take the total quota approved uh, in Alaska, you know, and then what proportion of it goes to the CDQs, and how will you see that in terms of uh, equity? Will you think that this is uh, reasonable, or, or, or what do you think? In your opinion, not that of Alaska, right? Fisheries right, right, and right. Yeah. Mm. Because I feel that that could be a good example of how to ensure some level of equity, right? What you guys are doing in Alaska, right? Um, so my my colleague uh, Marisha is is inserted some comments about the decennial program review for the CDQ program. Um, so there's a fair amount of disclosure involved in that, and and um, uh, detailed analysis of of CDQ group participation and benefit and uh, what they what they uh, do with uh, with their their earnings um, within it. I'm not sure how how well we can comprehensively look across all of uh, all of the places where CDQ groups have you know might have the opportunity to be engaged in a particular way um, and the degree to which they actually are, um, broadly speaking. Within individual management programs, I think we can assess that to some degree, um, particularly well in, in the CRAB program, um, less so in, in other places. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Rachel. I just had a follow-up to Rashid's. If I was understanding your question, um, the CDQs are allocated 10% off the top and the rest of the allocation happens after the CDQ allocation. At this point, I'm, gonna, I'm the species that are eligible for that. I think where we see inequities in that program is that CDQ communities are defined within 50 miles of the coastline. So there's kind of issues emerging by the communities just outside that boundary who don't receive the CDQ benefits but are impacted by federal fishery decision making. If I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah.
Any other questions or comments from the committee? I, I do have another quick question. I, was, I just wanted to kind of survey all the, the panel members and the participants today. If, if they have any um, examples or thoughts, some positive examples in terms of where equity was accounted for in a, a decision or a fishery management plan in their regions that they thought worked particularly well. And again, if, if you don't have something on the top of your head now, but something that comes to mind, um, sort of for me, it's always in the shower the next mo morning, but um, that's probably an idea. You don't want it, enough of that. Um, please email uh, St Stacy with uh, any responses that you have. Stacy, you had your. Uh, just to. Um concur with that and and to note that we appreciate so many folks being on the line today. I know we've heard primarily from um, the invited speakers uh, and some of their colleagues, but um, just to, to reiterate the point that we're interested in hearing from anybody that's uh, wanting to contribute. So um, please do not hesitate to uh, circulate information and use me as a conduit for that to the committee. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, you might have said this, and I might have missed it, this phrase. But maybe another way to say is: that, Is there a process undergoing that you think is going to lead to very valuable, rather than has it occurred? Because maybe there's highlighting like we just started this, and we think this is going to lead to a good outcome. That would also be very valuable mm -hmm. to get information. So sorry if I overlap. Brian, if you're speaking, we're not able to hear you. You might be muted on a phone line or otherwise muted. Um, I'm not muted. I, I didn't. I wasn't prompted to speak yet. Um, oh, Tom. Tom is muted. Else. That's why. Oh. No worries. <laughs> Go um, ahead, Brian. Well, I, yeah. So taking our 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 um, uh, sort of nascent uh, cra uh, crew uh, economic survey. Uh, that is in development. So that uh, will hopefully provide us with with um, with a rich data set that will allow us to to certain degrees to uh, to 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 measure participation by crew members with various aspects of you know demographic categories within the crew population, um, most notably, Community residents, um, but some other things, um, and uh, will allow us to look at the distribution of uh, at least uh, vessel earnings to those crew members and to those communities. Um, but uh, this data collection, while being comprehensive, hopefully across federal fisheries, is going to leave out. Um, uh, state fisheries, uh, so that's that's a concern. Um, I'm sure that that you know once we, so you know we can we can we can uh, we can report out 
um, you know, estimated earnings at the, at the say, community level or certain aggregates that allow us to, to get past confidentiality constraints. But the, the, the geographic distribution of benefits across communities and um, but then the the ways to slice those by different attributes of communities um, is it's just very difficult to conceive of, of uh, exactly how what dimensions of uh, equity to focus on um, and the sort of critical thresholds of uh, inequitable or maldistributional outcomes to to draw attention to. Can I just follow In up? response to that? Yeah, yeah, please. Brian, um, is this requirement that the crew need to get a license, is that driven by the state of Alaska? Is that a rule from the state or is this somehow tied to NOAA fisheries? Right. No, it's a, it's a state law. It's a state law. Does anybody else know if another state has a similar requirement? I haven't. I don't know of a similar requirement. I, I mean, it, it creates the ability to do a sample frame, right? Because you have this registration and you can actually track crew across vessels and across fisheries. And it seems really interesting that way. I would guess it must have something more to do with an income concern from the state rather than from a fisheries concern that they're worried about lost re revenue for people who seasonally move to Alaska and leave would be my guess. Uh, Leaf. Yeah, I was gonna say one potential, I think promising avenue of you know equity analyses in, in our center is this west coast fisheries participation survey that, that was briefly mentioned and and it while it wasn't designed with addressing equity and fisheries management benefits directly it, it does present a subset of interesting questions I, I think that would allow some some interesting um analyses and so i i may or may not have mentioned that survey respondents characterize themselves according to geographic location, fisheries, self-reported incomes, and then maybe more importantly, membership and groups identified as underserved. And so, um, and some other questions along the, on the survey are perceived impacts of management inter interventions. I think a potentially interesting one to me anyway, is perceived representation in the management process and then capacity to participate in management decision-making processes. So I, Again, it depends on the equity questions that you're trying to address and answer, but I, I do think that this survey provides some interesting information. Rashid? I have a question. Mike. Okay, I forgot that. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I'm wondering if uh, you can, maybe each one of you, one or two benefits from fisheries management that you know about. What, what are the benefits? We've been talking about benefits of fisheries management. I know some of you touch on that, but just to go around and drop a few words for us. And... That's why you, you, you do day in, day out, right? Uh, Justin? Justin, yeah. I'm thinking okay, well, I'll, I'll jump in here and, and talk about some of the benefits fisheries management. Well, we have sustainably, we fisheries, hear you. sustainably managed fisheries uh, within the Pacific Islands region. And I think all of the diverse benefits that I spoke to yeah. in my yeah. presentation are afforded to our region through sustainable fisheries management. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess I, I'm a little hesitant to bring this up, but I, I will say, and maybe this is, I think, with my Science Center hat off, but, um, you know, I think one of the things the council might be interested in, and I'm hesitant to speak on behalf of council, but um, yeah. a lot of their concerns, I know we're talking about the benefits of fisheries management, but I think an equity 
of said benefits. I think a concern at times from communities in our region is the equity in the cost and burden of fisheries mm -hmm. management to our region, or maybe stated otherwise when there are policies perhaps outside of the scope of fisheries management that apply to our region and, and there's concerns about whether those are equitably applied mm -hmm. across the nation. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that because that's not what I should be speaking to. And this Thank is you. excellent, actually. Yeah, I, Justin, you've just had nodded heads around the room yeah. in many senses that that your comments about the costs of participation uh, in the Western Pacific region is clearly a burden um, that that region shares that is higher probably than the other re 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 regions. So th thank you for that comment. Any other uh, responses to Rashid's probing question about the benefits of fishery management? If not, I'm gonna draw um, the afternoon session and in fact, the day's open sessions to a close. Um, I want to thank all of you for your participation today in a very rich discussion. Um, we heard lots today about the, how difficult a challenge uh, the committee and the agency has faced, um, both from a theoretical point of view, and we heard from Dale about ideas of distribution of outcome versus distributions of opportunity. But also from a practical point of view, we heard particularly this morning um, about some of the practical challenges of collecting the kind of socioeconomic data that are required related to um, having survey implements approved about the challenge of using incentive-based programs. And I, I, you know, it's always surprising when you run into these things you'd not thought about that in a university system, we can give tickets that you might win, you know, $100, you might win $5, and that's fine in a university, but in an academic setting, that begins to look more like a lottery, and the federal government can't run a lot, 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 lot lottery. So things that probably many of us around the table um, don't recognize that you are faced as federal employees within the agency on a day-to-day basis. I, I was impressed um, by the idea that the regions are sort of their own independent experiments. And we heard lots about the differences between the regions today, um, about the, the specific challenges they face, um, whether that be at the science center or the council level. Um, or, or at the regional office le level. Um, we heard from Justin particularly with the, the nice graphic about the value of the fishery beyond the primary benefits that we've been tasked with of, of um, sort of allocation and per, per, per permits. And I thought the figure that um, you had, Justin, in your presentation was a particularly nice example of that. Um, we heard a lot of concern expressed today about capacity in the agency to, to undertake this work um, and probably also capacity in the councils to undertake this work, um, that, that this has not been work that the agency and the councils have traditionally uh, been involved in, but it is um, work that they are now beginning to be challenged and asked uh, to undertake. Um, we heard from Brian the idea of the development of a community of practice, um, somewhat akin to the community of practice that exists in the stock assessment field, where there are regular national convenings that the SSCs bring together to try and learn from the experiments that are going on in every region, in every different fishery. And I, I thought that was a nice idea. But I suppose to me the, the most important message 
that came through in the discussions today um, was from everyone we heard from and from the committee members themselves was a recognition of the importance of, of the work. It is clear that stakeholders and council members, um, uh, federal representatives, and the agency itself is, is deeply committed to understanding um, whether or not the benefits of fisheries management, however we define them, are equitably dis distributed. And, and I think, to me, that was the most important message of today. Um, and I think Rashid's uh, response to my comment questioning whether we are ready to do this uh, is exactly the right one. Whether we're ready or not, we're going to be doing this and we need just to be getting on with it. And, and uh, I think we as a committee have to find a way to produce useful recommendations to the agency for how it will be more ready to answer this question in five years time than it is today. So I want to thank all of you um, on the call today, all of you who have presented to us uh, a reminder that if a moment of inspiration hits you and you want to communicate with us, please do so through Stacy. Um, she will ensure that the information gets to all of us on, on the committee. Um, we have several more uh, meetings um, coming up one in August, and we think there'll be another one in September. We are hoping for uh, a draft of our report by, I would hope, late September at the latest, just as a note to the committee itself, um, that time is ticking. Um, and uh, we value all of your input uh, into our deliberations. So thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, we will, sorry, you can clap if you wish. <laughs> Stace. And I just want to add uh, my appreciation as well. And um, note, I've put my email address in the chat for folks to reach me. Also, I'd like to point out, um, as Tom mentioned, our next uh, scheduled open session meeting is August 14th and 16th. Uh, we have quite a blended agenda shaping up for that, um, but we welcome everybody on the line to join us for that as well. Uh, the information for joining on the line will be available on our website uh, soon, uh, but if you'd like more information on that open session meeting, please don't hesitate to reach out to me as well, and we can make sure to provide that. Can I just clarify, is tomorrow morning not an open session? I'm sorry, tomorrow morning is also an open yeah, session. I yes, forgot. so separate and apart from today and tomorrow morning, our next open session yep. meeting is in August. Um, we do also hope that folks will uh, join us tomorrow morning.